brought this upon herself. The wagon passed under a particularly thick canopy of trees, blotting out the light. For a heartbeat, the silence peeled back long enough for that question to worm its way into her skull, into her skin, into her breath and her bones. And in the dark, she remembered. Chapter One Eleven Days Earlier Selena Sardothian had been waiting for this night for the past year. Sitting on the wooden walkway tucked into the side of the gilded dome of the Royal Theater, she breathed in the music rising from the orchestra far below. Her legs dangled over the railing edge, and she leaned forward to rest her cheek on her folded arms. The musicians were seated in a semicircle on the stage. They filled the theater with such wondrous noise that Selena sometimes forgot how to breathe. She had seen this symphony performed four times in the past four years, but she'd always gone with Arobin. It had become their annual autumn tradition. Though she knew she shouldn't, she let her eyes drift to the private box where, until last month, she'd always been seated. Was it from spite or sheer blindness that Arobin Hommel now sat there, Lysandra at his side? He knew what this night meant to Selena, knew how much she'd looked forward to it every year. And though Selena hadn't wanted to go with him, and never wanted to do anything with him again, tonight he'd brought Lysandra, as if this night didn't mean anything to him at all. Even from the rafters, she could see the king of the assassins holding the hand of the young courtesan, his leg resting against the skirts of her rose-colored gown. A month after Arobin had won the bidding for Lysandra's virginity, it seemed that he was still monopolizing her time. It wouldn't be a surprise if he'd worked out something with her madam to keep Lysandra until he tired of her. Selena wasn't sure if she pitied Lysandra for it. Selena returned her attention to the stage. She didn't know why she'd come here, or why she'd told Sam that she had plans and couldn't meet him for dinner at their favorite tavern. In the past month, she hadn't seen or spoken to Arobin, nor had she wanted to. But this was her favorite symphony. The music so lovely that, to fill the year-long wait between performances, she'd mastered a fair portion of it on the piano forte. The symphony's third movement finished, and applause thundered across the shimmering arc of the dome. The orchestra waited for the clapping to die down before it swept into the joyous allegro that led to the finale. At least in the rafters, she didn't have to bother dressing up and pretending to fit in with the bejeweled crowd below. She had easily snuck in from the roof, and no one had looked up to see the black-clad figure seated along the railing, nearly hidden from view by the crystal chandeliers that had been raised and dimmed for the performance. Up here, she could do what she liked. She could rest her head on her arms, or swing her legs in time with the music, or get up and dance if she wanted to. So what if she'd never again sit in that beloved box, so lovely with its red velvet seats and polished wooden banisters? The music braided through the theater, and each note was more brilliant than the last. She'd chosen to leave Arobin. She'd paid off her debt to him, and Sam's debt to him, and had moved out. She'd walked away from her life as Arobin Hommel's protege, that had been her decision, and one she didn't regret, not after Arobin had so sorely betrayed her. He'd humiliated and lied to her, and used her blood money to win Lysandra's bidding just to spite her. Though she still fancied herself Otterlin's assassin, part of her wondered how long Arobin would allow her to keep the title before he named someone else his successor. But no one could truly replace her. Whether or not she belonged to Arobin, she was still the best. She'd always be the best. Wouldn't she? She blinked, realizing she'd somehow stopped hearing the music. She should change spots, move to a place where the chandeliers blocked out her view of Aerobin and Lysandra. She stood, her tailbone aching from sitting for so long on the wood. Selena took a step, the floorboard sagging under her black boots, but paused though it was as she'd remembered it, every note flawless, 
the music felt disjointed now, even though she could play it from memory. It was suddenly like she'd never heard it before, or like her internal beat was now somehow off from the rest of the world. Selena glanced again at the familiar box far below, where Arobin was now draping a long, muscled arm along the back of Lysandra's seat. Her old seat. The one closest to the stage. It was worth it, though. She was free. And Sam was free. And Arobin. He had done his best to hurt her. To break her. Forgoing these luxuries was a cheap price to pay for a life without him lording over her. The music worked itself into the frenzy of its climax, becoming a whirlwind of sound that she found herself walking through. Not toward a new seat, but toward the small door that led onto the roof. The music roared, each note a pulse of air against her skin. Selena threw the hood of her cloak over her head as she slipped out the door and into the night beyond. It was nearing eleven when Selena unlocked the door to her apartment, breathing in the already familiar sense of home. She'd spent much of the past month furnishing the spacious apartment, hidden on the upper floor of a warehouse in the slums that she now shared with Sam. He'd offered again and again to pay for half of the apartment, but each time she ignored him. It wasn't because she didn't want his money, though she truly didn't, but rather because... For the first time ever, this was a place that was hers. And though she cared deeply for Sam, she wanted to keep it that way. She slipped inside, taking in the great room that greeted her. To the left, a shining oak dining table large enough to fit eight upholstered chairs around it. To her right, a plush red couch, two armchairs, and a low-lying table set before the darkened fireplace. The cold fireplace told her enough. Sam wasn't home. Selena might have gone into the adjacent kitchen to devour the remaining half of the berry tart Sam hadn't finished at lunch. Might have kicked off her boots and reclined before the floor-to-ceiling window to take in the stunning nighttime view of the Capitol. She might have done any number of things, had she not spied the note atop the small table beside the front door. I've gone out. It said in Sam's handwriting, Don't wait up. Selena crumpled the note in her fist. She knew exactly where he'd gone, and exactly why he didn't want her to wait up. Because if she were asleep, then she most likely wouldn't see the blood and bruises on him when he staggered in. Swearing viciously, Selena threw the crumpled note on the ground and stalked out of the apartment, slamming the door shut behind her. If there was a place in Rifthold where the scum of the capital could always be found, it was the vaults. On a relatively quiet street of the slums, Selena flashed her money to the thug standing outside the iron door and entered the pleasure hall. The heat and reek hit her almost immediately, but she didn't let it crack her mask of cold calm as she descended into a warren of subterranean chambers. She took one look down at the teeming crowd around the main fighting pit and knew exactly who was causing them to cheer. She swaggered down the stone steps, her hands in easy reach of the swords and daggers sheathed at the belt slung low over her hips. Most people would have opted to wear even more weapons to the vaults. But Selena had been here often enough to anticipate the threats the usual clientele posed, and she knew she could look after herself just fine. Still. She kept her hood over her head, concealing most of her face in shadow. Being a young woman in a place like this wasn't without its obstacles, especially when a good number of men came here for the other entertainment offered by the vaults. As she reached the bottom of the narrow stairs, the reek of unwashed bodies, stale ale, and worse things hit her full on. It was enough to turn her stomach, and she was grateful that she hadn't eaten anything recently. She slipped through the crowd packed around the main pit, trying not to look to the exposed rooms on either side, to the girls and women who weren't fortunate enough to be sold into an upper-class brothel like Lysandra. Sometimes, when Selena was feeling particularly inclined to make herself miserable, she'd wonder if their fate would have been hers had Arobin not taken her in. 
she'd wonder if she'd gaze into their eyes and see some version of herself staring back. So it was easier not to look. Selena pushed past the men and women assembled around the sunken pit, keeping alert for grasping hands eager to part her from her money, or one of her exquisite blades. She leaned against a wooden pillar and stared into the pit. Sam moved so fast the hulking man in front of him didn't stand a chance, dodging each knockout blow with power and grace. Some of it natural, some learned from years of training at the Assassin's Keep. Both of them were shirtless, and Sam's toned chest gleamed with sweat and blood. Not his blood, she noticed. The only injuries she could see were his split lip and a bruise on his cheek. His opponent lunged, trying to tackle Sam to the sandy floor. But Sam whirled, and as the giant stumbled past, Sam drove his bare foot into his back. The man hit the sand with a thud that Selena felt through the filthy stone floor. The crowd cheered. Sam could have rendered the man unconscious in a heartbeat. He could have snapped his neck just now, or ended the fight in any number of ways. But from the half-wild, self-satisfied gleam in Sam's eyes, Selena knew he was playing with his opponent. The injuries on his face had probably been intentional mistakes, to make it look like a somewhat even fight. Fighting in the vault wasn't only about knocking out your opponent. It was about making a show out of it. The crowd near savage with elation, Sam probably had been giving them one hell of a performance. And judging by the blood on Sam, it seemed like this performance was probably one of several encores. A low growl rippled through her. There was only one rule in the vaults. No weapons, just fists. But you could still get horribly hurt. His opponent staggered to his feet, but Sam had finished waiting. The poor brute didn't even have time to raise his hands as Sam lashed out with a roundhouse kick. His foot slammed into the man's face hard enough for the impact to sound over the shouts of the crowd. The opponent reeled sideways, blood spurting from his mouth. Sam struck again, a punch to the gut. The man doubled over, only to meet Sam's knee to his nose. His head snapped skyward, and he stumbled back, back, back. The crowd screamed its triumph as Sam's fist, coated in blood and sand, connected with the man's exposed face. Even before he finished swinging, Selena knew it was a knockout punch. The man hit the sand and didn't move. Panting, Sam lifted his bloodied arms to the surrounding crowd. Selena's ears nearly shattered at the answering roar. She gritted her teeth as the master of ceremonies strode onto the sand, proclaiming Sam the victor. It wasn't fair, really. No matter what opponents they threw his way, any person that went up against Sam would lose. Selena had half a mind to hop into the pit and challenge Sam herself. That would be a performance the vaults would never forget. She gripped her arms. She hadn't had a contract in the month since she'd left Arobin. And though she and Sam continued training as best they could, oh, the urge to jump into that pit and take them all down was overwhelming. A wicked smile spread across her face. If they thought Sam was good then she'd really give the crowd something to scream for. Sam spotted her leaning against the pillar. His triumphant grin remained, but she saw a glimmer of displeasure flash in his brown eyes. She inclined her head toward the exit. The gesture told him all he needed to know. Unless he wanted her to get into the pit with him, he was done for tonight, and she'd meet him on the street when he had collected his earnings. And then the real fight would begin. Should I be relieved or worried that you haven't said anything? Sam asked her, as they strode through the back streets of the capital, weaving their way home. Selena dodged a puddle that could have been either rainwater or urine. I've been thinking of ways to begin that don't involve screaming. Sam snorted, and she ground her teeth. A bag of coins jangled at his waist. Although the hood of his cloak was pulled up over his head, she could still clearly see his split lip. She fisted her hands. You promised you wouldn't go back there. 
Sam kept his eyes on the narrow alley ahead of them, always alert, always watching for any source of danger. I didn't promise. I said I'd think about it. People die in the vaults! She said it louder than she meant to, her words echoing off the alley walls. People die because they're fools in search of glory. They're not trained assassins. Accidents still happen. Any of those men could have snuck in a blade. He let out a quick, harsh laugh, full of pure male arrogance. You really think so little of my abilities? They turned down another street, where a group of people were smoking pipes outside a dimly lit tavern. Selena waited until they were past them before speaking. Risking yourself for a few coins is absurd. We need whatever money we can get, Sam said quietly. She tensed. We have money. Some money. Less and less each day. It won't last forever. Not when we haven't been able to get any other contracts. And especially not with your lifestyle. My lifestyle, she hissed. But it was true. She could rough it but her heart lay in luxury, in fine clothes and delicious food and exquisite furnishings. She'd taken for granted how much of that had been provided for her at the Assassin's Keep. Aerobin might have kept a detailed list of the expenses she owed him, but he'd never charged them for their food, or their servants, or their carriages. And now that she was on her own... The vaults are easy fights, Sam said. Two hours there and I can make decent money. The vaults are a festering pile of shit, she snapped. We're better than that. We can make our money elsewhere. She didn't know where, or how exactly, but she could find something better than fighting in the vaults. Sam grabbed her arm, making her stop to face him. Then what if we left Rifthold? Though her own hood covered most of her features, she raised her brows at him. What's keeping us here? Nothing. Everything. Unable to answer him, Selena shook off his grasp and continued walking. It was an absurd idea, really. Leaving Rifthold? Where would they even go? They reached the warehouse and were quickly up the rickety wooden stairs at the back, then inside the apartment on the second floor. She didn't say anything to him as she tossed off her cloak and boots, lit some candles, and went into the kitchen to down a piece of bread slathered in butter. And he didn't say anything as he strode into the bathing room and washed himself. The running water was a luxury the previous owner had spent a fortune on, and had been the biggest priority for Selena when she was looking for places to live. Benefits like running water were plentiful in the capital, but not widespread elsewhere. If they left a rift hold, what sorts of things would she have to go without? She was still contemplating that, when Sam padded into the kitchen, all traces of blood and sand washed away. His bottom lip was still swollen, and he had a bruise on his cheek, not to mention his raw knuckles. But he looked to be in one piece. Sam slid into one of the chairs at the kitchen table and cut himself a piece of bread. Buying food for the house took up more time than she'd realized it would, and she'd been debating hiring a housekeeper, but... That'd cost money. Everything cost money. Sam took a bite, poured a glass of water from the ewer she'd left sitting on the oak table, and leaned back in his chair. Behind him, the window above the sink revealed the glittering sprawl of the capital and the illuminated glass castle towering over them all. Are you just not going to speak to me ever again? She shot him a glare. Moving is expensive. If we were to leave Rifthold, then we'd need a little more money so we could have something to fall back on if we can't get work right away. Selena contemplated it. One more contract each, she said. I might not be Arobin's protege anymore, but I'm still Otterland's assassin, and you're... Well, you're you. He gave her a dark look, and despite herself, Selena grinned. One more contract, she repeated, and we could move. It help with the expenses. Give us enough of a cushion. Or we could say to hell with it and go. I'm not giving up everything just to slum it somewhere. If we leave, we'll do it my way. 
Sam crossed his arms. You keep saying if, but what else is there to decide? Again, nothing. Everything. She took a long breath. How will we establish ourselves in a new city without Arabin's support? Triumph flashed in Sam's eyes. She leashed her irritation. She hadn't said outright that she was agreeing to move, but her question was confirmation enough for the both of them. Before he could answer, she went on. We've grown up here, and yet in the past month, we haven't been able to get any hires. Arobin always handled those things. Intentionally, Sam growled. And we do just fine, I think. We're not going to need his support. When we move, we're leaving the guild, too. I don't want to be paying dues for the rest of my life, and I don't want anything to do with that conniving bastard ever again. Yes, but you know that we need his blessing. We need to make amends and need him to agree to let us leave the guild peacefully. She almost choked on it, but managed to get the words out. Sam shot out of his seat. Do I need to remind you what he did to us? What he's done to you? You know that the reason we can't find any hires is because Arobin made sure word got out that we weren't to be approached. Exactly! And it will only get worse! The Assassin's Guild would punish us for beginning our own establishment elsewhere, without Arobin's approval. Which was true. While they'd paid their debts to Arobin, they were still members of the Guild, and still obligated to pay them dues every year. Every assassin in the Guild answered to Arobin. Obeyed him. Selena and Sam had both been dispatched more than once to hunt down Guild members who had gone rogue, refused to pay their dues, or broken some sacred Guild rule. Those assassins had tried to hide, but it had only been a matter of time before they'd been found and the consequences hadn't been pleasant. Selena and Sam had brought Arobin and the Guild a lot of money and earned them a fair amount of notoriety, so their decisions and careers had been closely monitored. Even with their debts paid, they'd be asked to pay a parting fee if they were lucky. If not, well, it'd be a very dangerous request to make. So, she went on, unless you want to wind up with your throat cut... We need to get Arobin's approval to break from the guild before we leave. And since you seem in such a hurry to get out of the capital, we'll go see him tomorrow. Sam pursed his lips. I'm not going to grovel. Not to him. Neither am I. She stalked to the kitchen sink, bracing her hands on either side of it as she looked out the window. Rift told. Could she truly leave it behind? She might hate it at times, but this was her city. Leaving that, starting over in a new city somewhere on the continent, could she do it? Footsteps thudded on the wooden floor. A warm breath caressed her neck, and then Sam's arms slipped around her waist from behind. He rested his chin on the crook between her shoulder and neck. I just want to be with you, he murmured. I don't care where we go. That's all I want. She closed her eyes and leaned her head against his. He smelled of her lavender soap, her expensive lavender soap that she'd once warned him to never use again. He probably had no idea what soap she'd even been scolding him about. She'd have to start hiding her beloved toiletries and leave out something inexpensive for him. Sam wouldn't be able to tell the difference anyway. I'm sorry I went to the vaults he said onto her skin, planting a kiss beneath her ear. A shiver went down her spine. Though they'd been sharing the bedroom for the past month, they hadn't yet crossed that final threshold of intimacy. She wanted to, and he certainly wanted to. But so much had changed so quickly. Something that monumental could wait a while longer. It didn't stop them from enjoying each other, though. Sam kissed her ear his teeth grazing her earlobe, and her heart stumbled a beat. Don't use kissing to swindle me into accepting your apology, she got out, even as she tilted her head to the side to allow him better access. He chuckled, his breath caressing her neck. It was worth a shot. 
If you go to the vaults again, she said as he nibbled on her ear, I'll hop in and beat you unconscious myself. She felt him smile against her skin. You could try. He bit her ear. Not hard enough to hurt, but enough to tell her that he'd now stopped listening. She whirled in his arms, glaring up at him, at his beautiful face illuminated by the glow of the city, at his eyes, so dark and rich. And you used my lavender soap. Don't you ever do that. But then Sam's lips found hers, and Selena stopped talking for a good while after that. Yet as they stood there, their bodies twining around each other, there was still one question that remained unasked. One question neither of them dared voice. Would Arab and Hamel let them leave? Chapter Two When Selena and Sam entered the Assassin's Keep the next day, it was as if nothing had changed. The same trembling housekeeper greeted them at the door before scuttling away, and Wesley, Arobin's bodyguard, was standing in his familiar position outside the King of the Assassin's study. They strode right up to the door, Selena using every step, every breath, to take in details. Two blades strapped to Wesley's back, one at his side, two daggers sheathed at his waist, the glint of one shining in his boot, probably one more hidden in the other boot, too. Wesley's eyes were alert, keen, not a sign of exhaustion or sickness or anything that she could use to her advantage if it came to a fight. But Sam just strolled right up to Wesley, and despite how quiet he'd been on their long walk over, he held out a hand and said, Good to see you, Wesley. Wesley shook Sam's hand and gave a half smile. I'd say you look good, boyo, but that bruise says otherwise. Wesley looked at Selena, who lifted her chin and huffed. You look more or less the same, he said, a challenging gleam in his eyes. He'd never liked her, never bothered to be nice, as if he'd always known that she and Arobin would wind up on opposite sides and that he'd be the first line of defense. She strode right past him. And you still look like a jackass, she said sweetly, and opened the doors to the study. Sam muttered an apology as Selena entered the room and found Arobin waiting for them. The King of the Assassins watched them with a smile, his hands steepled on the desk in front of him. Wesley shut the door behind Sam, and they silently took seats in the two chairs before Arobin's massive oak desk. One glance at Sam's drawn face told her that he, too, was remembering the last time the two of them had been in here together. That night had ended with both of them beaten into unconsciousness at Arobin's hands. That had been the night that Sam's loyalty had switched, when he'd threatened to kill Arobin for hurting her. It had been the night that changed everything. Arobin's smile grew, a practiced, elegant expression disguised as benevolence. As overjoyed as I am to see you in good health, he said. Do I even want to know what brings the two of you back home? Home. This wasn't her home now, and Arobin knew it. The word was just another weapon. Sam bristled, but Selena leaned forward. They'd agreed that she would do the talking, since Sam was more likely to lose his temper when Arobin was involved. We have a proposal for you, she said keeping perfectly still. Coming face to face with Arobin, after all his betrayals, made her stomach twist. When she'd walked out of this office a month ago, she'd sworn that she'd kill him if he bothered her again. And Arobin, surprisingly, had kept his distance. Oh. Arobin leaned back in his chair. We're leaving Rifthold, she said, her voice cool and calm. And we'd like to leave the guild, too. Ideally, we'd establish our own business in another city on the continent. Nothing that would rival the guild, she added smoothly. Just a private business for us to make ends meet. She might need his approval, but she didn't have to grovel. Arobin looked from Selena to Sam. His silver eyes narrowed on Sam's split lip. Lovers quarrel. A misunderstanding. Selena said before Sam could snap a retort. 
Of course Arobin would refuse to immediately give them an answer. Sam gripped the wooden arms of his chair. Ah, Arobin replied, still smiling, still calm and graceful and deadly. And where exactly are you living now? Somewhere nice, I hope. It wouldn't do to have my best assassins living in squalor. He'd make them play this game of exchanging niceties until he wanted to answer their question. Beside her, Sam was rigid in his seat. She could practically feel the hot rage rippling off of him as Arobin said, My assassins. Another razor-sharp use of words. She bit down on her own rising anger. You look well, Arobin, she said. If he didn't answer her questions, then she certainly wouldn't answer his. Especially ones about their current location, though he probably already knew. Arobin waved a hand, leaning back in his seat. This keep feels too empty without you both. He said it with such conviction, as if they'd left just to spite him, that she wondered if he meant it, if he'd somehow forgotten what he'd done to her and how he'd treated Sam. And now that you are talking of moving away from the capital and leaving the guild. Arobin's face was unreadable. She kept her breathing even, kept her heartbeat from racing. A non-answer to her question. She kept her chin high. Then is it acceptable to the guild if we leave? Every word balanced on the edge of a blade. Arobin's eyes glittered. You are free to move away. Move away. He hadn't said anything about leaving the guild. Selena opened her mouth to demand a clearer statement, but then... Give us a damned answer! Sam's teeth were bared, his face white with anger. Arobin looked at Sam, his smile so deadly that Selena fought the urge to reach for a dagger. I just did. You two are free to do whatever you want. She had seconds, perhaps before Sam truly exploded, before he'd start a brawl that would ruin everything. Arobin's smile grew, and Sam's hands casually dropped to his sides, his fingers so, so near the hilt of his sword and dagger. Shit. We're willing to offer this much to leave the guild, Selena interrupted, desperate for anything to get them from coming to blows. Gods above she was aching for a fight, but not this one. Not with Arobin. Thankfully, both Arobin and Sam turned to her as she named the sum. That price is more than satisfactory for us to leave and set up our own business elsewhere. Arobin looked at her for a too long moment before he made her a counter offer. Sam shot to his feet. Are you insane? Selena was too stunned to move. That much money? He had to know somehow how much she had left in the bank because paying him what he asked would wipe it out entirely. The only money they'd have would be Sam's meager savings, and whatever she could get from the apartment, which might be hard to sell, given its location and unusual layout. She countered his offer with another, but he just shook his head and stared up at Sam. You two are my best, Arobin said with maddening calm. If you leave, then the respect and the money you'd provide the guild would be lost. I have to account for that. This price is generous. Generous? Sam hissed. But Selena, her stomach churning, lifted her chin. She could keep throwing figures at him until she was blue in the face, but he'd obviously picked this number for a reason. He would not budge. It was one last slap in the face. One final twist of the knife meant only to punish her. I accept, she said, giving him a bland smile. Sam whipped his head around, but she kept her eyes on Arabin's elegant face. I'll have the funds transferred to your account immediately. And once that's done, we're leaving. And I expect to never be bothered by you or the guild again. Understood? Selena rose to her feet. She had to get far away from here. Coming back had been a mistake. She shoved her hands in her pockets to hide how they were starting to tremble. Arobin grinned at her. And she realized he already knew. Understood.
You had no right to accept his offer, Sam raged. His face set with such fury that people along the Broad City Avenue practically jumped out of his way. No right to do that without consulting me. You didn't even bargain. Selena peered into the shop windows as she walked by. She loved the shopping district in the heart of the capital. The clean sidewalks lined with trees. The main avenue leading right up to the marble steps of the Royal Theater. The way she could find anything from shoes to perfumes to jewelry to fine weapons. If we pay that, then we definitely need to find a contract before we leave. If we pay that, she said. I am paying that. Like hell you are. It's my money and I can do what I want with it. You paid for your debt and mine already. I'm not letting you give him another copper. We can find some way around paying this parting fee. They walked past the crowded entrance of a popular tea court, where finely dressed women were chatting with each other in the warm autumn sun. Is the issue that he demanded so much money, or that I'm paying it? Sam pulled up short, and though he didn't look twice at the tea court ladies, they certainly looked at him. Even with anger rolling off him, Sam was beautiful, and too angry to notice that this was not the spot to argue. Selena grabbed his arm, yanking him along. She felt the eyes of the ladies on her as she did so. She couldn't help a flicker of smugness as they took in her dark blue tunic, with its exquisite gold embroidery along the lapels and cuffs, her fitted ivory pants, and her knee-high brown boots made with butter-soft leather. While most women, especially the wealthy or noble-born ones, opted to wear dresses and miserable corsets, pants and tunics were common enough that her fine clothing wouldn't have escaped the appreciation of the women idling outside the tea courts. The issue, Sam said through his teeth, is that I'm sick of playing games, and I'd just as soon cut his throat as pay that money. Then you're a fool. If we leave Rifthold on bad terms, we'll never be able to settle anywhere, not if we want to keep our current occupation. And even if we decided to find honest professions instead, I'd always wonder if he or the guild would show up one day and demand that money. So if I have to give him every last copper in my bank account to ensure that I can sleep in peace for the rest of my life, so be it. They reached the enormous intersection at the heart of the shopping district, where the domed royal theater rose above streets packed with horses and wagons and people. Where do we draw the line? Sam asked her quietly. When do we say enough? This is the last time. He let out a derisive snort. I'm sure it is. He turned down one of the avenues, in the opposite direction from home. Where are you going? He looked over his shoulder. I need to clear my head. I'll see you at home. She watched him cross the busy avenue, watched until he was swallowed up by the hustle of the capital. Selena began walking, too, wherever her feet took her. She passed by the steps of the Royal Theater and kept walking, the shops and vendors blurring together. The day was blossoming into a truly lovely example of autumn. The air was crisp, but the sun was warm. In some ways, Sam was right. But she'd dragged him into this mess. She'd been the one who had started things in Skull's Bay. Though he claimed to have been in love with her for years, if she'd only kept her distance these past few months... He wouldn't be in this situation. Perhaps, if she'd been smart, she would have just broken his heart and let him remain with Arobin. Having him hate her was easier than this. She was... responsible for him now, and that was terrifying. She cared for him more than she'd ever cared for anyone. Now that she'd ruined the career he'd worked for his whole life, she'd hand over all her money to make sure that he could at least be free but she couldn't just explain that she paid for everything because she felt guilty. He'd resent that. Selena paused her walking and found herself at the other end of the broad avenue, across the street from the gates to the glass castle. She hadn't realized she'd walked so far or been so lost in her thoughts. She usually avoided coming this close to the castle. The heavily guarded iron gates led to a long tree-lined path 
that snaked up to the infamous building itself. She craned her head back to take in the towers that brushed the sky, the turrets sparkling in the mid-morning sun. It had been built atop the original stone castle and was the crowning achievement in Otterland's empire. She hated it. Even from the street, she could see people milling about the distant castle grounds, uniformed guards, ladies in voluminous dresses, servants clad in the clothes of their station. What sort of lives did they lead, dwelling within the shadow of the king? Her eyes rose to the highest gray stone tower, where a small balcony jutted out, covered with creeping ivy. It was so easy to imagine that the people within had nothing to worry about. But inside that shining building, decisions were made daily that altered the course of Aurelia. Inside that building, it had been decreed that magic was outlawed, and that labor camps like Calicula and Endovia were to be established. Inside that building, the murderer who called himself King dwelled, the man she feared above all others. If the vaults were the heart of Rifthold's underworld, then the glass castle was the soul of Otterland's empire. She felt like it watched her, a giant beast of glass and stone and iron. Staring at it made her problems with Sam and Arobin feel inconsequential, like gnats buzzing before the gaping maw of a creature poised to devour the world. A chill wind blew past, ripping strands of hair from her braid. She shouldn't have let herself walk so close, even if the odds of ever encountering the king were next to none. Just the thought of him sent a wretched fear splintering through her. Her only consolation was that most people from the kingdoms conquered by the king probably felt the same way. When he'd marched into Terrasen nine years ago, his invasion had been swift and brutal. So brutal that it made even Selena sick to recall some of the atrocities that had been committed to secure his rule. Shuddering, she turned on her heel and headed home. Sam didn't return until dinner. Selena was sprawled on the couch before the roaring fireplace, book in hand, when Sam strode into the apartment. His hood still covered half of his face, and the hilt of the sword strapped to his back glinted in the orange light of the room. As he locked the door behind him, she caught the dull gleam of the gauntlet strapped to his forearms, thick, embroidered leather that concealed hidden daggers. He moved with such precise efficiency and controlled power that she blinked. Sometimes it was so easy to forget that the young man she shared the apartment with was also a trained, ruthless killer. I found a client. He pulled off his hood and leaned against the door, his arms crossed over his broad chest. Selena shut the book she'd been gobbling down and set it on the couch. Oh? His brown eyes were bright, though his face was unreadable. They'll pay. A lot and they want to keep it from reaching the Assassin's Guild's ears. There's even a contract in it for you. Who's the client? I don't know. The man I spoke to had the usual disguises. Hood, unremarkable clothing. He could have been acting on behalf of someone else. Why do they want to avoid using the Guild? She moved to perch on the arm of the couch. The distance between her and Sam felt too large, too full of lightning because they want me to kill Iowan Jane and his second-in-command, Rourke Farron. Selena stared at him. Iowan Jane? The biggest crime lord in Rifthold. Sam nodded. A roaring filled her ears. He's too well-guarded, she said. And Farron? That man is a psychopath. He's a sadist. Sam approached her. You said that in order to move to another city, we need money. And since you're insisting on paying off the guild, then we really need money. So unless you want to wind up as thieves, I suggest we take it. She had to tilt her head back to look at him. Jane is dangerous. Then it's good that we're the best, isn't it? Though he gave her a lazy smile, she could see the tension in his shoulders. We should find another contract. There's bound to be someone else. You don't know that, and no one else would pay this much. He named the figure, and Selena's brows rose. They'd be very comfortable after that. 
They could live anywhere. You're sure you don't know who the client is? Are you looking for excuses to say no? I'm trying to make sure that we're safe, she snapped. Do you know how many people have tried to take out Jane and Farron? Do you know how many of them are still alive? Sam ran a hand through his hair. Do you want to be with me? What? Do you want to be with me? Yes! Right now, that was all she wanted. A half-smile tugged at one corner of his lips. Then we'll do this, and we'll have enough money to tie up our loose ends in Rifthold and set ourselves up somewhere else on the continent. If you asked, I'd still leave tonight without giving Erobin or the Guild a copper. But you're right. I don't want to spend the rest of our lives looking over our shoulders. It should be a clean break. I want that for us. Her throat tightened, and she looked toward the fire. Sam hooked a finger under her chin and tilted her head up to him again. So will you go after Jane and Farron with me? He was so beautiful. So full of all the things that she wanted. All that she hoped for. How had she never noticed that until this year? How had she spent so long hating him? I'll think about it, she rasped. It wasn't just bravado. She did need to think about it. Especially if their targets were Jane and Farron. Sam's smile grew, and he leaned down to brush a kiss to her temple. Better than a no. Their breath mingled. I'm sorry for what I said earlier today. An apology from Selena Sardothian? His eyes danced with light. Do I dream? She scowled, but Sam kissed her. She wrapped her arms around his neck, opening her mouth to his, and a low growl escaped from him as their tongues met. Her hands tangled in the strap that held his sword against his back, and she withdrew long enough to unclasp the scabbard buckle across his chest. His sword clattered to the wooden floor behind them. Sam looked her in the eyes again and it was enough for her to grab him closer. He kissed her thoroughly, lazily, as if he had a lifetime of kisses to look forward to. She liked that. A lot. He slid one arm around her back, and the other beneath her knees, sweeping her up in a fluid, graceful movement. Though she'd never tell him, she practically swooned. He carried her from the living room and into the bedroom, gently setting her down on the bed. He withdrew only long enough to remove the deadly gauntlets from his wrists, followed by his boots, cloak, jerkin, and shirt beneath. She took in his golden skin and muscled chest, the slender scars that peppered his torso, her heart beating so fast she could hardly breathe. He was hers. This magnificent, powerful creature was hers. Sam's mouth found hers again and he eased her farther onto the bed. Down, down, his clever hands exploring every inch of her, until she was on her back, and he braced himself on his forearms to hover over her. He kissed her neck, and she arched up into him as he ran his hand down the plane of her torso, unbuttoning her tunic as he went. She didn't want to know where he had learned to do these things, because if she ever learned the names of those girls... Her breath hitched as he reached the last button and pulled her out of the jacket. He looked down at her body, his breathing ragged. They had gone further than this before, but there was a question in his eyes. A question written over every inch of his body. Not tonight, she whispered, her cheeks flaring with heat. Not yet. I'm in no rush, he said, bending down to graze his nose along her shoulder. It's just... God's above, she should stop talking. She didn't owe him an explanation, and he didn't push it with her, but... If I'm only going to do this once, then I want to enjoy every step. He understood what she meant by this. This relationship between them. This bond that was forming. So unbreakable and unyielding that it made the entire axis of her world shift toward him. That terrified her more than anything. I can wait, he said thickly, kissing her collarbone. We have all the time in the world. Maybe he was right. And spending all the time in the world with Sam? That was a treasure worth paying anything for. 
Chapter 3 Dawn crept into their room, filling it with golden light that caught in Sam's hair and made it shine like bronze. Propped on one elbow, Selena watched him sleep. His bare torso was still gloriously tanned from the summer, suggesting days spent training in one of the courtyards of the keep, or maybe lounging on the banks of the Avery. Scars of varying lengths were scattered across his back and shoulders, some of them slender and even, some of them thicker and jagged, a life spent training and battling. His body was a map of his adventures, or proof of what growing up with Arab and Hommel was like. She ran a finger down the groove of his spine. She didn't want to see another scar added to his flesh. She didn't want this life for him. He was better than that. Deserved better. When they moved, maybe they couldn't leave behind death and killing and all that came with it. Not at first, but someday. Far in the future, perhaps. She brushed the hair from his eyes. Someday they would both lay down their swords and daggers and arrows. And by leaving Rifthold, by leaving the guild, they'd take the first step toward that day, even if they had to keep working as assassins for a few more years at least. Sam's eyes opened, and finding her watching him, he gave her a sleepy smile. It hit her like a punch to the gut. Yes, for him. She could someday give up being Otterland's assassin, give up the notoriety and fortune. He pulled her down, wrapping an arm around her bare waist and tucking her in close to him. His nose grazed her neck, and he breathed her in deeply. Let's take down Jane and Farron, she said softly. Sam purred a response onto her skin that told her he was only half awake and that his mind was on anything but Jane and Farron. She dug her nails into his back, and he grunted his annoyance, but made no move to awaken. We'll eliminate Farron first, to weaken the chain of command. It'd be too risky to take them both out at once. Too many things could go wrong. But if we take out Farron first, even if it means Jane's guards will be on the alert, they'll still be in total chaos, and that's when we'll dispatch Jane. It was a solid plan. She liked this plan. They merely needed a few days to figure out Farron's defenses and how to get around them. Sam mumbled another response that sounded like, Anything you want, just go back to sleep. Selena looked up at the ceiling and smiled. After breakfast, and after she'd gone to the bank to transfer a huge sum of money to Arobin's account, an event that left both Selena and Sam rather miserable and on edge, they spent the day gathering information on Io and Jane. As the biggest crime lord in Rifthold, Jane was well protected, and his minions were everywhere. Orphan spies in the streets, harlots working in the vaults, barkeeps and merchants, and even some city guards. Everyone knew where his house was. A sprawling three-story building of white stone, on one of the nicest streets in Rifthold. The place was so well watched that it was too risky to do more than walk past. Even stopping to observe for a few minutes might spark the interest of one of the disguised henchmen loitering on the street. It seemed absurd that Jane would have his house on this street. His neighbors were well-off merchants and minor nobility. Did they know who lived next door? And what sort of evil went on beneath the emerald-tiled roof? They had a stroke of good luck as they meandered past the house, looking for all the world like a well-dressed handsome couple on a morning walk through the capital. Just as they were passing by, Farron, Jane's second, swaggered out the door, heading for the black carriage parked out front. Selena felt Sam's arm tense under her hand. He kept looking ahead, not daring to stare at Farron for too long in case someone noticed. But Selena pretending that she'd discovered a pull in her forest green tunic, was able to glance over a few times. She'd heard about Farron. Most everyone had. If she had a rival for notoriety, it was him. Tall, broad-shouldered, and in his late twenties, Farron had been born and abandoned in the streets of Rifthold. He'd begun working for Jane as one of his orphan spies, 
and over the years had clawed his way up the ranks of Jane's twisted court, leaving a trail of bodies in his wake, until he was appointed second. Looking at him now, with his fine gray clothes and his gleaming black hair slicked into submission, it was impossible to tell that he'd once been one of the vicious little beasts that roamed the slums in feral packs. As he walked down the stairs to the carriage that awaited him in the private drive, Farron's steps were smooth, calculated, his body rippling with barely restrained power. Even from across the street, Selena could see how his dark eyes shone, his pale face set in a smile that made a shiver go down her spine. The bodies Farron had left in his wake, she knew, hadn't been left in one piece. Somewhere in the years he'd spent rising from orphan to second, Farron had developed a taste for sadistic torture. It had earned him his spot at Jane's side and kept his rivals from challenging him. Farron slung himself into the carriage. The movement was so easy that his well-tailored clothes barely shifted out of place. The carriage started down the driveway, turned onto the street, and Selena looked up as it ambled past only to see Farron looking out the window, staring right at her. Sam pretended not to notice. Selena kept her face utterly blank, the disinterest of a well-bred lady who had no idea that the person staring at her like a cat watching a mouse was actually one of the most twisted men in the Empire. Farron gave her a smile. There was nothing human in it. And that was why their client had offered a kingdom's ransom for Farron's and Jane's deaths. She bobbed her head in a demure deflection of his attention, and Farron's grin only grew before the carriage continued past and was swallowed up in the flow of city traffic. Sam loosed a breath. I'm glad we're taking him out first. A dark, wicked part of her wished the opposite, wished that she could see that feline grin vanish when Farron found out that Selena Sardothian had killed Jane. But Sam was right. She wouldn't sleep one wink if they took out Jane first, knowing Farron would expend all his resources hunting them down. They made a long, slow circle around the streets surrounding Jane's house. It'd be easier to catch Farron on his way somewhere, Selena said, all too aware of how many eyes were tracking them on these streets. The house is too well guarded. I'll probably need two days to figure it out, Sam said. You will need? I figured you'd want the glory of taking out Jane, so I'll dispatch Farron. Why not work together? His smile faded. Because I want you to stay out of this for as long as possible. Just because we're together doesn't mean I've become some weakling ninny. I'm not saying that. But can you blame me for wanting to keep the girl I love away from someone like Farron? And before you begin to rattle off your accomplishments, let me tell you that I do know how many people you've killed and the scrapes you've gotten out of. But I found this client, so we're doing it my way. If there hadn't still been eyes on every corner, Selena might have hit him. How dare you! Farron is a monster, Sam said, not looking at her. You said so yourself. And if anything goes wrong, the last place I want you to be is in his hands. We'd be safer if we worked together. A muscle feathered in his jaw. I don't need you looking out for me, Selena. Is this because of the money? Because I'm paying for things? It's because I'm responsible for this hire and because you don't always get to make the rules. At least let me do some aerial spotting for you, she said. She could let Sam take on Farron. She could become secondary for this mission. Hadn't she just accepted that she could someday let go of being Otterlin's assassin? He could have the spotlight. No aerial spotting, Sam said sharply. You'll be on the other side of the city, far away from this. You know how ridiculous that is, don't you? I've had just as much training as you, Selena. She might have pushed it, might have kept arguing until he gave in, but she caught the flicker of bitterness in his eyes. She hadn't seen that bitterness in months. Not since Skull's Bay, when they'd been all but enemies. Sam had always been forced to watch while glory was heaped upon her, and always taken whatever missions she didn't deign to accept. Which was absurd, really, given how talented he was. 
if death-dealing could be called a talent. And while she loved strutting around, calling herself Otterlin's assassin, with Sam that sort of arrogance now sometimes felt like cruelty. So though it killed a part of her to say it, and though it went against all her training to agree, Selena nudged him with a shoulder and said, Fine. You take down Farron by yourself, but I get to dispatch Jane. And then we'll do it my way. Selena had her weekly dancing lesson with Madame Florine, who also trained all of the dancers at the Royal Theatre. So she left Sam to finish his scouting as she headed to the old woman's private studio. Four hours later, sweaty and aching and utterly spent, Selena made her way back home across the city. She'd known the stern Madame Florine since she was a child. She taught all of Arobin's assassins the latest popular dances. But Selena liked to take extra lessons because of the flexibility and grace the classical dances instilled. She'd always suspected the terse instructor had barely tolerated her. But to her surprise, Madame Florine had refused to take any pay for lessons now that she'd left Arobin. She'd have to find another dance instructor once they moved. More than that, a studio with a decent pianoforte player. And the city would have to have a library, too. A great, wonderful library. Or a bookshop with a knowledgeable owner who could make sure her thirst for books was always sated. And a good clothier. And perfumer. And jeweler. And confectionery. Her feet dragged as she walked up the wooden steps to her apartment above the warehouse. She blamed it on the lesson. Madame Florine was a brutal task mistress. She didn't accept limp wrists or sloppy posture or anything except Selena's very best, though she did always turn a blind eye to the last twenty minutes of their lesson. When she allowed Selena to tell the student on the pianoforte to play her favorite music and set herself loose, dancing with wild abandon. And now that Selena had no pianoforte of her own in the apartment, Madame Florine even let her remain after the lesson to practice. Selena found herself atop the stair landing, staring at the silvery green door. She could leave Rifthold. If it meant being free of Arabin, she could leave behind all these things she loved. Other cities on the continent had libraries and bookshops and fine outfitters, perhaps not as wonderful as Rifthold's, and perhaps the city's heart wouldn't beat with the familiar rhythm that she adored, but for Sam, she could leave. Sighing, Selena unlocked the door and walked into the apartment. Arobin Hommel was sitting on her couch. Hello, darling, he said, and smiled. Chapter 4 Alone in the kitchen, Selena poured herself a cup of tea, trying to keep her hands from shaking. He'd probably gotten the address from the servants who had helped bring over her things. To find him here, having broken into her home? How long had he been sitting inside? Had he gone through her things? She poured another cup of tea for Arobin. Cups and saucers in hand, she walked back into the living room. He had his legs crossed, one arm sprawled across the back of the sofa, and seemed to have made himself quite at home. She said nothing as she gave him the cup, and then took a seat in one of the armchairs. The hearth was dark, and the day had been warm enough that Sam had left one of the living room windows open. A briny breeze off the Avery flowed into the apartment, rustling the crimson velvet curtains and teasing through her hair. She'd miss that smell, too. Arobin took a sip, then peered into his teacup to look at the amber liquid inside. Who can I thank for the impeccable taste in tea? Me, but you already know that. Hmm. Arobin took another sip. You know, I did know that. The afternoon light caught in his gray eyes, turning them to quicksilver. What I don't know is why you and Sam think it's a good idea to dispatch Io and Jane and Rourke Farron. Of course he knew. It's none of your business. Our client wanted to operate outside of the guild, and now that I've transferred the money to your account, Sam and I are no longer a part of it. Iowin Jane, Arabin repeated, as if she somehow didn't know who he was. 
Iowan Jane. Are you insane? She clenched her jaw. I don't see why I should trust your advice. Even I wouldn't take on Jane. Arobin's gaze burned. And I'm saying that as someone who has spent years thinking of ways to put that man in a grave. I'm not playing another one of your mind games. She set down her tea and rose from her seat. Get out of my house. Arobin just stared up at her as if she were a sullen child. Jane is the undisputed crime lord in Rifthold for a reason. And Farron is his second for a damn good reason, too. You might be excellent, Selena, but you're not invincible. She crossed her arms. Maybe you're trying to dissuade me because you're worried that when I kill him, I will have truly surpassed you. Arobin shot to his feet, towering over her. The reason I'm trying to dissuade you, you stupid, ungrateful girl, is because Jane and Farron are lethal. If a client offered me the glass castle itself, I wouldn't touch an offer like that. She felt her nostrils flare. After all that you've done, how can you expect me to believe a word that comes out of your mouth? Her hand had started drifting toward the dagger at her waist. Arobin's eyes remained on her face, but he was aware. He knew every movement her hands made and didn't have to look at her to track them. Get out of my house, she growled. Arobin gave her a half smile and looked around the apartment with deliberate care. Tell me something, Selena. Do you trust Sam? What sort of question is that? Arobin casually slid his hands into the pockets of his silver tunic. Have you told him the truth about where you came from? I have a feeling that's something he'd like to know, perhaps before he dedicates his life to you. She focused on keeping her breathing even, and pointed at the door again. Go! Arobin shrugged waving a hand as if to dismiss the questions he'd raised, and walked toward the front door. She watched his every move, took in every step and shift of his shoulders, noted what he looked at. He reached for the brass doorknob, but turned to her. His eyes, those silver eyes that would probably haunt her for the rest of her life, were bright. No matter what I have done, I really do love you, Selena. The word hit her like a stone to the head. He'd never said that word to her before. Ever. A long silence fell between them. Arobin's neck shifted as he swallowed. I do the things that I do because I'm afraid. And because I don't know how to express what I feel. He said it so quietly that she barely heard it. I did all of those things because I was angry with you for picking Sam. Was it the King of the Assassins who spoke, or the father, or the lover who had never manifested himself? Arobin's carefully cultivated mask fell, and the wound she'd given him flickered in those magnificent eyes. Stay with me, he whispered. Stay in Rifthold. She swallowed, and found it particularly hard to do so. I'm going. No, he said softly. Don't go. No. That was what she'd said to him that night he'd beaten her. In the moment before he'd struck her, when she thought he was going to hurt Sam instead. And then he'd beaten her so badly she'd been knocked unconscious. Then he'd beaten Sam, too. Don't. That was what Ansel had said to her in the desert, when Selena had pressed the sword into the back of her neck when the agony of Ansel's betrayal had been almost enough to make Selena kill the girl she'd called a friend. But that betrayal still paled in comparison to what Arobin had done to her, when he'd tricked her into killing Donovan, a man who could have freed countless slaves. He was using words as chains to bind her again. He'd had so many chances over the years to tell her that he loved her. He'd known how much she craved those words but he hadn't spoken them until he needed to use them as weapons. And now that she had Sam, Sam, who said those words without expecting anything in return, Sam, who loved her for reasons she would never understand. Selena tilted her head to the side, the only warning she gave that she was still ready to attack him. Get out 
of my house. Arobin just nodded slowly and left. The Black Signet Tavern was packed wall to wall, as it was most nights. Seated with Sam at a table in the middle of the busy room, Selena didn't particularly feel like eating the beef stew in front of her, or like talking, even though Sam had told her all about the information he'd gathered on Farron and Jane. She hadn't mentioned Arobin's surprise visit. A cluster of giggling young women sat nearby, tittering about how the Crown Prince was gone on holiday to the Syrian coast, and how they wished they could join the prince and his dashing friends, and on and on until Selena contemplated chucking her spoon at them. But the Black Signet wasn't a violent tavern. It catered to a crowd who came to enjoy good food, good music, and good company. There were no brawls, no dark dealings, and certainly no prostitutes milling about. Perhaps that was what brought her and Sam back here for dinner most nights. It felt so normal. It was another place she'd miss. When they arrived home after dinner, the apartment feeling strangely not hers now that Arobin had broken in, Selena went straight to the bedroom and lit a few candles. She was ready for this day to be over. Ready to dispatch Jane and Farron, and then leave. Sam appeared in the doorway. I've never seen you so quiet, he said. She looked at herself in the mirror above the dresser. The scar from her fight with Ansel had faded from her cheek, and the one on her neck was well on its way to disappearing, too. I'm tired, she said. It wasn't a lie. She began unbuttoning her tunic, her hands feeling strangely clumsy. Was this why Arobin had visited? Because he'd known he'd impact her like this? She straightened, hating the thought so much that she wanted to shatter the mirror in front of her. Did something happen? She reached the final button of her tunic, but didn't take it off. She turned to face him, looking him up and down. Could she ever tell him everything? Talk to me, he said, his brown eyes holding only concern. No twisted agendas, no mind games. Tell me your deepest secret, she said softly. Sam's eyes narrowed, but he pushed off the threshold and took a seat on the edge of the bed. He ran a hand through his hair, setting the ends sticking up at odd angles. After a long moment, he spoke. The only secret I've borne my entire life is that I love you. He gave her a slight smile. It was the one thing I believed I'd go to the grave without voicing. His eyes were so full of light that it almost stopped her heart. She found herself walking toward him, then placing one hand along his cheek and threading the other through his hair. He turned his head to kiss her palm, as if the phantom blood that coated her hands didn't bother them. His eyes found hers again. What's yours, then? The room felt too small. The air too thick. She closed her eyes. It took her a minute, and more nerve than she realized. But the answer finally came. It had always been there, whispering to her in her sleep, behind every breath, a dark weight that she couldn't ever escape. Deep down, she said, I'm a coward. His brows rose. I'm a coward, she repeated, and I'm scared. I'm scared all the time, always. He removed her hand from his cheek to kiss the tips of her fingers. I get scared, too, he murmured onto her skin. You want to hear something ridiculous? Whenever I'm scared out of my wits, I tell myself, My name is Sam Cortland, and I will not be afraid. I've been doing it for years. It was her turn to raise her brows. And that actually works? He laughed onto her fingers. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, but it usually makes me feel better to some degree, or it just makes me laugh at myself a bit. It wasn't the sort of fear she'd been talking about, but... I like that, she said. He laced his fingers with hers and pulled her onto his lap. I like you, he murmured, and Selena let him kiss her until she'd again forgotten the dark burden that would always haunt her. Chapter 5 
Rourke Farron was a busy, busy man. Selena and Sam were waiting a block away from Jane's house before dawn the next morning, both of them wearing nondescript clothing, and cloaks with hoods deep enough to cover most of their features without giving alarm. Farron was out and about before the sun had fully risen. They trailed his carriage through the city, observing him at each stop. It was a wonder he even had time to indulge in his sadistic delights, because Jane's business certainly took up plenty of his day. He took the same black carriage everywhere, more proof of his arrogance, since it made him an easily marked target. Unlike Donneville, who was constantly guarded, Farron seemed to deliberately go without guards, daring anyone to take him on. They followed him to the bank, to the dining rooms and taverns owned by Jane, to the brothels and the black market stalls hidden in crumbling alleys, then back to the bank again. He made several stops at Jane's house in between, too. And then he surprised Selena once by going into a bookshop, not to threaten the owner or collect dues, but to buy books. She'd hated that for some reason, especially when, despite Sam's protest, She'd quickly snuck in while the bookseller was in the back and spied the receipt ledger behind the desk. Farron hadn't bought books about torture or death or anything wicked. Oh, no. They'd been adventure novels. Novels that she had read and enjoyed. The idea of Farron reading them, too, felt like a violation somehow. The day slipped by, and they learned little except for how brazenly he traveled about. Sam should have no trouble dispatching him tomorrow night. When the sun was shifting into the golden hues of late afternoon, Farron pulled up at the nondescript iron door that led down into the vaults. At the end of the street, Selena and Sam watched him as they pretended to be washing dung off their boots at a public spigot. It seems fitting that Jane owns the vaults, Sam said quietly over the gushing water. Selena gave him a glare, or she would have if the hood hadn't been in the way. Why do you think I got so mad about you fighting there? If you ever got into any trouble with the people at the vaults, ever pissed them off, you're significant enough that Farron himself would come to punish you. I can handle Farron. She rolled her eyes. I didn't expect him actually to make a visit, though. Seems too dirty here, even for him. Should we take a look? The street was quiet. The vaults came alive at night but during the day, there wasn't anyone in the alley except for a few stumbling drunks and a half-dozen guards always posted outside. It was a risk, she supposed, going into the vaults after Farron, but if Farron truly rivaled her for notoriety, it would be interesting to get a sense of what he was really like before Sam ended his life tomorrow night. Let's go, she said. They flashed silver at the guards outside then tossed it to the guards inside, and they were in. The thugs asked no questions, and didn't demand they remove their weapons or their hoods. Their usual clientele wanted discretion while partaking in the twisted delights of the vaults. From the top of the stairs just inside the front door, Selena instantly spotted Farron sitting at one of the scarred and burned wooden tables in the center of the room, talking to a man she recognized as Helmson, the master of ceremonies during the fights. A small lunchtime crowd had gathered at the other tables, though they'd all cleared a ring around Farron. At the back of the chamber, the pits were dark and quiet, slaves working to scrape off the blood and gore before the night's revelries. Selena tried not to look too long at the shackles and broken posture of the slaves. It was impossible to tell where they'd come from, if they'd begun as prisoners of war or had just been stolen from their kingdoms. She wondered if it was better to wind up as a slave here or a prisoner in a brutal labor camp like in Dovier. Both seemed like similar versions of a living hell. Compared to the teeming crowds the other night, the vaults were practically deserted today. Even the prostitutes in the exposed chambers flanking the sides of the cavernous space were resting while they could. Many of the girls slept in tangled heaps on the narrow cots barely hidden from view by the shabby curtains designed to give the illusion of privacy. She wanted to burn this place into nothing but ashes, and then let everyone know that this wasn't the sort of thing Otterlin's assassins stood for. 
Perhaps after they'd taken out Theron and Jane, she'd do just that. One final bit of glory and retribution from Selena Sardothian. One last chance to make them remember her forever before she left. Sam kept close to her as they reached the bottom of the stairs and strode to the bar tucked into the shadows beneath. A wisp of a man stood behind it, pretending to wipe down the wooden surface while his watery blue eyes stayed fixed on Farron. Two ales, Sam growled. Selena thumped a silver coin down on the bar, and the barkeep's attention snapped to them. She was grossly overpaying, but the barkeep's slender, scabbed hands vanished the silver in the blink of an eye. There were enough people still inside the vaults that Selena and Sam could blend in, mostly drunks who never left the premises, and people who seemed to enjoy this sort of wretched environment while eating their lunch. Selena and Sam pretended to drink their ales, sloshing the alcohol on the ground when no one was looking, and watched Farron. There was a locked wooden chest resting on the table beside Farron and the squat master of ceremonies, a chest that Selena had no doubt was full of the vault's earnings from the night before. Farron's attention was fixed with feline intensity on Helmson, the chest seemingly forgotten. It was practically an invitation. How mad do you think he'd be if I stole that chest? Selena pondered. Don't even entertain the idea. She clicked her tongue. Spoil sport. Whatever Farron and Helmson were discussing, it was over quickly. But instead of going back up the stairs, Farron walked over to the warren of girls. He prowled past every alcove and stone chamber, and all the girls straightened. Sleeping ones were hastily awakened. Any sign of sleep vanished by the time Farron stalked past. He looked them over, inspecting, making comments to the man who hovered behind him. Helmson nodded and bowed and barked orders at the girls. Even from across the room, the terror on the girls' faces was evident. Both Selena and Sam struggled to keep from going rigid. Farron crossed the large chamber and inspected the dens on the other side. By that time, the girls there were prepared. When Farron had finished, he looked over his shoulder and nodded to Helmson. Helmson sagged with what could only be a relief, but then paled and quickly found somewhere else to be, as Farron snapped his fingers at one of the sentries near a small door. Immediately, the door opened, and a shackled, dirty, muscular man was dragged out by another sentry. The prisoner looked half dead already. But the moment he saw Farron... He started begging, thrashing against the sentry's grip. It was hard to hear, but Selena discerned enough from the man's frantic pleading to get the gist of it. He was a fighter in the vaults, owed Jane more money than he could ever repay, and had tried to cheat his way out of it. Although the prisoner promised to repay Jane with interest, Farron just smiled, letting the man babble until at last he paused for a shuddering breath. Then Farron jerked his chin toward a door hidden behind a ragged curtain, and his smile grew as the sentry dragged the still-pleading man toward it. As the door opened, Selena caught a glimpse of a stairwell that swept downward. Without so much as a look in the direction of the patrons discreetly watching from their tables, Farron led the sentry and his prisoner inside and shut the door. Whatever was about to happen was Jane's version of justice. Sure enough, five minutes later, a scream pierced through the vaults. It was more animal than human. She'd heard screams like that before, had witnessed enough torture at the keep to know that when people screamed like that, it meant that the pain was just beginning. By the end, when that sort of pain happened, the victims had usually blown out their vocal cords, and could only emit hoarse, shattered shrieks. Selena gritted her teeth so hard her jaw hurt. The barkeep gave a sharp wave to the minstrels in the corner, and they immediately started up a song to cover the noise. But screams still echoed up from beneath the stone floor. Farron wouldn't kill the man right away. No. His pleasure came from the pain itself. It's time to leave, Selena said noting how tightly Sam gripped his mug. We can't just... We can, she said sharply. Believe me, I'd like to burst in there, too. 
but this place is designed like a death trap, and I've no desire to make my final stand here or right now. Sam was still staring at the stairwell door. When the time comes, she added, putting a hand on his arm, you'll make sure he pays his debt. Sam turned to her, his face concealed within the shadows of the hood, but she could read the aggression in his body well enough. He'll pay his debt for all of this, Sam snarled. And that's when Selena noticed that some of the girls were weeping. Some shook. Some just stared at nothing. Yes, Farron had visited before, had used that room to do Jane's dirty work, while reminding everyone else not to cross the crime lord. How many horrors had these girls witnessed? Or at least heard? The screams were still rising up from below when they left the vaults. She had intended to lead them home, but Sam insisted on going to the public park, built along a well-off neighborhood beside the Avery River. After meandering along the neat gravel walkways, he slumped onto a bench facing the water. He pulled off his hood and rubbed his face with his broad hands. We're not like that, he whispered through his fingers. Selena sank onto the wooden bench. She knew exactly what he meant. The same thought had been echoing through her head as they walked here. They had been taught how to kill and maim and torture. She knew how to skin a man and keep him alive while doing it. She knew how to keep someone awake and coherent during long hours of torment. Knew where to inflict the most pain without having someone bleed out. Arobin had been so, so clever about it, too. He'd brought in the most despicable people. Rapists, murderers, rogue assassins who had butchered innocents and he'd made her read all of the information he'd gathered on them. Made her read about all the awful things they'd done, until she was so enraged she couldn't think straight, until she was aching to make them suffer. He'd honed her anger into a lethal blade, and she'd let him. Before Skull's Bay, she'd done it all and had rarely questioned it. She'd pretended that she had some moral code, lied to herself and said that since she didn't enjoy it, it meant that she had some excuse. But she had still stood in that chamber beneath the assassin's keep and seen the blood flow toward the drain in the sloped floor. We can't be like that, Sam said. She took his hands, easing them away from his face. We're not like Farron. We know how to do it, but we don't enjoy it. That's the difference. His brown eyes were distant, as he watched the gentle current of the Avery making its way toward the nearby sea. When Arobin ordered us to do things like that, we never said no. We had no choice. But we do now. Once they left Rifthold, they'd never have to make a choice like that again. They could create their own codes. Sam looked at her, his expression so haunted and bleak it made her sick. But there was always that part that part that did enjoy it when it was someone who truly deserved it. Yes, she breathed. Yes, there was always that part. But we still had a line, Sam. We still stayed on the other side of it. Lines don't exist for someone like Farron. They weren't like Farron. Sam wasn't like Farron. She knew that in her bones. Sam would never be like Farron. He'd never be like her, either. She sometimes wondered if he knew just how dark she could turn. Sam leaned against her, resting his head on her shoulder. When we die, do you think we'll be punished for the things we've done? She looked at the far bank of the river, where a row of ramshackle houses and docks had been built. When we die, she said, I don't think the gods will even know what to do with us. Sam glanced at her a hint of amusement shining in his eyes. Selena smiled at him, and the world, for one flickering heartbeat, felt right. The dagger whined as Selena sharpened it, the reverberations shooting through her hands. Seated beside her on the floor of the great room, Sam poured over a map of the city, tracing streets with his fingers. The fireplace before them cast everything into flickering shadows, a welcome warmth on a chill night. They had returned to the vaults in time to see Farron entering his carriage again, 
so they spent the rest of the afternoon stalking him. More trips to the bank and other locations. More stops back at Jane's house. She'd gone off on her own for two hours to trail Jane. To get another subtle glimpse at the house and see where the crime lord went. It was two uneventful hours of figuring out where his spies hid on the streets, since Jane didn't emerge from the building at all. If Sam planned to dispatch Farron tomorrow night, they agreed that the best time to do it would be when he took a carriage from the house to wherever else he had dealings, either for himself or Jane. After a long day of running errands for Jane, Farron was sure to be drained, his defenses sloppy. He wouldn't know what was coming until his lifeblood spilled. Sam would be wearing the special suit that the master tinkerer from Melisande had made for him, which in itself was its own armory. The sleeves possessed concealed built-in swords. The boots were specifically designed for climbing, and thanks to Selena, Sam's suit was equipped with an impenetrable patch of spider silk right over his heart. Selena had her own suit, of course, used only sparingly now that the convoy from Melisande had returned home. If either suit needed repairs, it'd be near impossible to find someone in Rifthold skilled enough. But dispatching Farron was definitely an occasion worth the risk. In addition to the suit's defenses, Sam would also be equipped with the extra blades and daggers that Selena was now sharpening. She tested an edge against her hand, smiling grimly as her skin stung. Sharp enough to cut air, she said, sheathing it and setting it down beside her. Well, Sam said, eyes still flitting across the map. Let's hope I don't have to get close enough to use it. If all went according to plan... Sam would only need to fire four arrows. One each to disable the carriage driver and the footman, one for Farron, and one more just to make sure Farron was dead. Selena picked up another dagger and began sharpening that as well. She jerked her chin toward the map. Escape routes? A dozen planned already, Sam said, and showed her. With Jane's house as a starting point, Sam had picked multiple streets in every direction where he could fire his arrows, which led to multiple escape routes that would get Sam away as quickly as possible. Remind me again why I'm not going? The dagger in her hands let out a long whine. Because you'll be here packing. Packing? She stilled the sharpening knife in her hand. He returned his attention to the map. Then he said, very carefully, I secured us passage on a ship to the southern continent, leaving in five days. The southern continent? Sam nodded, still focusing on the map. If we're going to get away from Rifthold, then we're going to get away from this entire continent, too. That wasn't what we discussed. We decided to move to another city on this continent. And what if there's another Assassin's Guild on the southern continent? Then we'll ask to join them. I'm not going to grovel to join some no-name guild and be subservient to some would-be infamous assassins. Sam looked up. Is this really about your pride, or is it because of the distance? Both! She slammed down the dagger and the honing stone on the rug. I was willing to move to a place like Bunjali or Belhaven or Aniel. Not to an entirely new continent. A place we hardly know anything about. That wasn't part of the plan. At least we'd be out of Otterland's empire. I don't give a damn about the empire. He sat back, propping himself on his hands. Can't you just admit that this is about Aerobin? No, you don't know what you're talking about. Because if we sail for the southern continent, then he will never find us again. And I don't think you're quite ready to accept that. My relationship with Aerobin is... Is what? Over? Is that why you didn't tell me that he came to visit yesterday? Her heart skipped a beat. Sam went on. While you were trailing Jane today, he approached me in the street, and he seemed surprised that you hadn't said anything about his visit. He also told me to ask about what really happened before he found you half dead on that riverbank when we were children. Sam leaned forward, bracing a hand on the floor as he brought his face close to hers. And you know what I told him? His breath was hot on her mouth. That I didn't care. But he just kept trying to bait me, to make me not trust you. So after he walked away, 
I went right to the docks and found the first ship that would take us away from this damned continent. Away from him. Because even though we're out of the guild, he will never leave us alone. She swallowed hard. He said those things to you? About... about where I came from? Sam must have seen something like fear in her eyes, because he suddenly shook his head, his shoulders slumping. Selena, when you're good and ready to tell me the truth, you'll do it. And no matter what it is, when that day comes, I'll be honored that you trust me enough to do so. But until then, it's not my business. And it's not Arobin's business. It's not anyone's business but your own. Selena leaned her forehead against his, and some of the tightness in his body, and hers, melted away. What if moving to the southern continent is a mistake? Then we'll move somewhere else. We'll keep moving until we find the place we're meant to be. She shut her eyes and took a steadying breath. Will you laugh if I say that I'm scared? No, he said softly. Never. Maybe I should try your little trick. She took another breath. My name is Selena Sardothian, and I will not be afraid. He did laugh then, a tickle of breath on her mouth. I think you have to say it with a bit more conviction than that. She opened her eyes and found him watching her, his face a mixture of pride and wonder, and such open affection that she could see that far-off land where they'd find a home, see that future that awaited them and that glimmer of hope that promised happiness she'd never considered or dared yearn for. And even though the southern continent was a drastic change in their plans, Sam was right. A new continent for a new beginning. I love you, Sam said. Selena wrapped her arms around him and held him close, breathing in his scent. Her only reply was, I hate packing. Chapter 6 The next night, the clock on the mantel seemed to be stuck at nine o'clock. It had to be, because there was no way in hell that a minute could take this long. She'd been trying to read for the past two hours, trying and failing. Even an utterly sinful romance novel hadn't held her interest. And neither had playing cards, or digging out her atlas and reading about the southern continent or eating all the candy she'd hidden from Sam in the kitchen. Of course, she was supposed to be organizing the belongings she wanted to pack. When she'd complained to Sam about what a chore it'd be, he'd even gone so far as to take all their empty trunks out of the closet, and then pointed out that he would not be traveling with her dozens of shoes, and she could have them shipped to her once they found their home. After saying that, he'd wisely left the apartment to kill Farron. She didn't know why she hesitated to pack. She'd contacted the solicitor that morning. He had told her the apartment might be hard to sell, but she was glad to do the dealings over a long distance, and she told him she'd contact him as soon as she found her new home. A new home. Selena sighed as the clock arms shifted. A whole minute had passed. Of course, with Farron's schedule being somewhat erratic, Sam might have to wait a few hours for him to leave the house. Or maybe he'd already done the job and needed to lie low for a while, just in case someone traced him back here. Selena checked the dagger beside her on the couch, then glanced around the room for the hundredth time that evening, making sure all the concealed weapons were in their proper places. She wouldn't check on Sam. He'd wanted to do this on his own. And he could be anywhere now. The trunks lay by the window. Maybe she should start packing. Once they dispatched Jane tomorrow night, they'd need to be ready to leave the city as soon as that ship was available to board. Because while she certainly wanted the world to know that Selena Sardothian had made the kill, getting far from Rifthold would be in their best interest. Not that she was running away. The clock arms shifted again. Another minute. Groaning, Selena stood and walked to the bookshelf along the wall where she began pulling out books and stacking them into the nearest empty trunk. She'd have to leave her furniture and most of her shoes behind for now. But there was no way in hell she was going to move to the southern continent without all of her books. The clock struck eleven, and Selena headed into the streets, 
wearing the suit the master tinkerer had made for her, plus several other weapons strapped to her body. Sam should have been back by now. And even though there was still another hour until the time when they'd agreed she'd look for him if he hadn't returned, if he was truly in trouble, then she certainly wasn't going to sit around for another minute. The thought sent her sprinting down alleys, heading toward Jane's house. The slums were silent, but no more so than usual. Whores and barefoot orphans and people struggling to make a few honest coppers glanced at her as she ran past. No more than a shadow. She kept an ear out for any snippets of conversation that might suggest Farron was dead, but overheard nothing useful. She slowed to a stalking gait, her steps near silent on the cobblestones, as she neared the wealthy neighborhood in which Jane's house stood. Several affluent couples were walking around, heading back from the theater. But there were no signs of a disturbance. Though if Farron had been killed, then surely Jane would try to keep the assassination hidden for as long as possible. She made a long circuit through the neighborhood, checking on all the points where Sam had planned to be. Not a spot of blood or sign of a struggle. She even dared to walk across the street from Jane's house. The house was brightly lit and almost merry and the guards were at their posts, all looking bored. Perhaps Sam had found out that Farron wasn't leaving the house tonight. She might very well have missed him on his way home. He wouldn't be pleased when he learned she'd gone out to find him, but he would have done the same for her. Sighing, Selena hurried back home. Chapter 7 Sam wasn't at the apartment but the clock atop the mantel read one in the morning. Selena stood before the embers of the fireplace and stared at the clock, wondering if she was somehow reading it wrong. But it continued ticking, and when she checked her pocket watch, it also read one. Then two minutes past the hour. Then five minutes. She threw more logs on the fire and took off her swords and daggers, but remained in the suit, just in case. She had no idea when she began pacing in front of the fire, and only realized it when the clock chimed two, and she found herself still standing before the clock. He would come home any minute. Any minute. Selena jolted awake at the faint chime of the clock. She'd somehow wound up on the couch, and somehow fallen asleep. Four o'clock. She would go out again in a minute. Maybe he'd hidden in the assassin's keep for the night. Unlikely, but it was probably the safest place to hide after you'd killed Rourke Farron. Selena closed her eyes. The dawn was blinding, and her eyes felt gritty and sore as she hurried through the slums, then the wealthy neighborhoods, scanning every cobblestone, every shadowed alcove, every rooftop for any sign of him. Then she went to the river. She didn't dare breathe as she walked up and down the banks that bordered the slums, searching for anything, any sign of Farron, or, or, or. She didn't let herself finish that thought, though crippling nausea gripped her as she scanned the banks and docks and sewer depositories. He would be waiting for her at home, and then he'd chide her and laugh at her and kiss her, and then she'd dispatch Jane tonight and then they'd set sail on this river, and then out to the nearby sea, and then be gone. He would be waiting at home. He'd be home. Home. Noon. It couldn't be noon, but it was. Her pocket watch was properly wound, and hadn't once failed her in the years she'd had it. Each of her steps up the stairs to her apartment was heavy and light. Heavy and light the sensation shifting with each heartbeat. She'd stop by the apartment only long enough to see if he'd returned. A roaring silence hovered around her, a cresting wave that she'd been trying to outrun for hours. She knew that the moment the silence finally hit her, everything would change. She found herself atop the landing, staring at the door. It had been unlocked and left slightly ajar. A strangled sort of noise broke out of her, and she ran the last few feet. 
barely noticing as she threw open the door and burst into the apartment. She was going to scream at him and kiss him and scream at him some more. A lot more. How dare he make her- Arobin Hommel was sitting on her couch. Selena halted. The king of the assassins slowly got to his feet. She saw the expression in his eyes and knew what he was going to say long before he opened his mouth and whispered, I'm sorry. The silence struck. Chapter 8 Her body started moving, walking straight toward the fireplace before she really knew what she was going to do. They thought he was still living in the keep, Arobin said, his voice pitched at that horrible whisper. They left him as a message. She reached the mantle and grabbed the clock from where it rested. Selena, Arobin breathed. She hurled the clock across the room so hard it shattered against the wall behind the dining table. Its fragments landed atop the buffet table against the wall, breaking the decorative dishes displayed there, scattering the silver tea set she'd bought for herself. Selena, Arobin said again. She stared at the ruined clock, the ruined dishes and tea set. There was no end to this silence. There would never be an end, only this beginning. I want to see the body. The words came from a mouth she wasn't sure belonged to her anymore. No, Arobin said gently. She turned her head toward him, baring her teeth. I want to see the body. Arobin's silver eyes were wide, and he shook his head. No, you don't. She had to start moving, had to start walking anywhere, because now that she was standing still, once she sat down, she walked out the door, down the steps. The streets were the same. The sky was clear. The briny breeze off the Avery still ruffled her hair. She had to keep walking. Perhaps, perhaps they'd sent the wrong body. Perhaps Arobin had made a mistake. Perhaps he was lying. She knew Arobin followed her, staying a few feet behind as she strode across the city. She also knew that Wesley joined them at some point, always looking after Arobin, always vigilant. The silence kept flickering in and out of her ears. Sometimes it stopped long enough for her to hear the whinny of a passing horse, or the shout of a peddler, or the giggle of children. Sometimes none of the noises in the capital could break through. There had been a mistake. She didn't look at the assassins guarding the iron gates to the keep or at the housekeeper who opened the giant double doors of the building, or at the assassins who milled about the grand entrance and who stared at her with fury and grief mingling in their eyes. She slowed long enough for Arobin, trailed by Wesley, to step in front of her, to lead the rest of the way. The silence peeled back, and thoughts tumbled in. It had been a mistake, and when she figured out where they were keeping him, where they were hiding him. She'd stop at nothing to find him, and then she'd slaughter them all. Arobin led her down the stone stairwell at the back of the entrance hall. The stairs that led into the cellars and the dungeons and the secret council rooms below. The scrape of boots on stone. Arobin in front of her, Wesley trailing behind. Down and down, then along the narrow, dark passageway to the door across from the dungeon entrance. She knew that door, knew the room behind it, the mortuary where they kept their members until... No, it had been a mistake. Arobin took out a ring of keys and unlocked the door, but paused before opening it. Please, Selena, it's better if you don't. She elbowed past him and into the room. The square room was small and lit with two torches bright enough to illuminate. Illuminate. Each step brought her closer to the body on the table. She didn't know where to look first. At the fingers that went the wrong way, at the burns and careful deep slices in his flesh, at the face, the face she still knew, 
even when so many things had been done to destroy it beyond recognition. The world swayed beneath her feet, but she kept upright as she finished the walk to the table and looked down at the naked, mutilated body she had. She had. Farron had taken his time, and though that face was in ruins, it betrayed none of the pain he must have felt, none of the despair. This was some dream, or she had gone to hell after all, because she couldn't exist in the world where this had been done to him, where she'd paced like an idiot all night while he suffered, while Farron tortured him, while he ripped out his eyes and... Selena vomited on the floor. Footsteps. Then Arobin's hands were on her shoulder, on her waist, pulling her away. He was dead. Sam was dead. She wouldn't leave him like this, in this cold, dark room. She yanked out of Arobin's grasp. Wordlessly, she unfastened her cloak and spread it over Sam, covering the damage that had been so carefully inflicted. She climbed onto the wooden table and lay beside him, stretching an arm across his middle, holding him close. The body still smelled faintly like Sam, and like the cheap soap she'd made him use, because she was so selfish that she couldn't let him have her lavender soap. Selena buried her face in his cold, stiff shoulder. There was a strange, musky scent all over him, a smell that was so distinctly not Sam that she almost vomited again. It clung to his golden-brown hair, to his torn, bluish lips. She wouldn't leave him. Footsteps heading toward the door than the snick of it closing as Arobin left. Selena closed her eyes. She wouldn't leave him. She wouldn't leave him. Chapter 9 Selena awoke in a bed that had once been hers, but somehow no longer felt that way. There was something missing in the world, something vital. She arose from the depths of slumber, and it took her a long moment to sort out what had changed. She might have thought that she was awakening in her bed in the keep. Still Arobin's protege. Still Sam's rival. Still content to be Otterlin's assassin forever and ever. She might have believed it, if she hadn't noticed that so many of her beloved belongings were missing from this familiar bedroom. Belongings that were now in her apartment across the city. Sam was gone. Reality opened wide and swallowed her whole. She didn't move from the bed. She knew the day was drifting along because of the shifting light on the wall of the bedroom. She knew the world still passed by, unaffected by the death of a young man, unaware that he'd ever existed and breathed and loved her. She hated the world for continuing on. If she never left this bed, this room... Maybe she'd never have to continue on with it. The memory of his face was already blurring. Had his eyes been more golden brown or soil brown? She couldn't remember, and she'd never get the chance to find out. Never get to see that half-smile. Never get to hear his laugh. Never get to hear him say her name like it meant something special. Something more than being Otterland's assassin ever could. She didn't want to go out into a world where he didn't exist. So she watched the light shift and change. And let the world pass by without her. Someone was speaking outside her door. Three men with low voices. The rumble of them shook her from sleep to find the room was dark. The city lights glowing beyond the windows. Jane and Farron will be expecting retaliation, a man said. Harding one of Arobin's more talented assassins, and a fierce competitor of hers. Their guards will be on alert, said another. Turn, an older assassin. Then we'll take out the guards, and while they're distracted, some of us will go for Jane and Farron. Arobin. She had a foggy memory of being carried. Hours or years or a lifetime ago, up from that dark room that smelled of death and into her bed. Muffled replies from Turn and Harding. Then, We strike tonight, Arobin growled. 
Theron lives at the house, and if we time it right, we'll kill them both while they're in their beds. Getting to the second floor isn't as simple as walking up the stairs, Harding challenged. Even the exteriors are guarded. If we can't get through the front, then there's a small second-story window that we can leap through using the roof of the house next door. A leap like that could be fatal, Turn countered. Enough! Arobin cut in. I'll decide how to break in when we arrive. Have the others ready to go in three hours. I want us on our way at midnight. And tell them to keep their mouths shut. Someone must have tipped off Theron if he knew to set a trap for Sam. Don't even tell your servants where you're going. Grunted acquiescence, then footsteps as Turn and Harding walked away. Selena kept her eyes closed and her breathing steady as the lock turned in her bedroom door. She recognized the even, confident gait of the King of the Assassins striding toward her bed. Smelled him as he stood over her, watching. Felt his long fingers as they stroked through her hair, then along her cheek. Then the steps leaving, the door shutting and locking. She opened her eyes, the glow of the city offering enough light for her to see that the lock on the door had been altered since she'd left. It now locked only from the outside. He had locked her in. To keep her from going with them? To keep her from helping to pay back Farron for every inch of flesh he'd tortured? Every bit of pain Sam had endured? Farron was a master of torture, and he'd kept Sam all night. Selena sat up, her head spinning. She couldn't remember the last time she'd eaten. Food could wait. Everything could wait. Because in three hours... Arobin and his assassins would venture out to exact vengeance. They'd rob her of her claim to revenge. The satisfaction of slaughtering Farron and Jane and anyone who stood in her way. And she had no intention of letting them do it. She stalked to the door and confirmed that it was locked. Arobin knew her too well. Knew that when the blanket of grief had been ripped away. Even if she could spring the lock... She had no doubt that there was at least one assassin watching the hall outside her bedroom, which left the window. The window itself was unlocked, but the two-story drop was formidable. While she'd been sleeping, someone had taken off her suit and given her a nightgown. She'd ripped apart the armoire for any sign of the suit. Its boots were designed for climbing, but all she found were two black tunics, matching pants, and ordinary black boots. Fine. There were no weapons in sight, and she hadn't brought any in with her. But years of living in this room had its advantages. She kept her motions quiet as she pulled up the loose floorboards where she'd long ago hidden a set of four daggers. She sheathed two at her waist and tucked the other two into her boots. Then she found the twin swords she'd kept disguised as part of the bed frame since she was fourteen. Neither the daggers nor the sword had been good enough to bring with her when she moved. Today they would do. When she'd finished strapping the blades across her back, she rebraided her hair and fitted on her cloak, throwing the hood over her head. She'd killed Jane first, and then she'd drag Farron to a place where she could properly repay him and take however long she wanted. Days, even. When that debt was paid, when Farron had no more agony or blood to offer, she'd place Sam in the embrace of the earth, and sent him into the afterlife knowing he'd been avenged. She eased open the window, scanning the front courtyard. The dew-slick stones glimmed in the damp light, and the sentries at the iron gate seemed focused on the street beyond. Good. This was her kill, her revenge to take. No one else's. A black fire rippled in her gut, spreading through her veins as she hopped onto the windowsill and eased outside. Her fingers found purchase in the large white stones, and, with one eye on the guards at the distant gate, she climbed down the side of the house. No one noticed her. No one looked her way. The keep was silent. The calm before the storm that would break when Arobin and his assassins began their hunt. Her landing was soft, no more than a whisper of boots against slick cobblestones. The guards were so focused on the street that they wouldn't notice when she jumped the fence near the stables around the back. Creeping around the exterior of the house was as simple as getting out of her room, and she was well within the shadows of the stables 
when a hand reached out and grabbed her. She was hurled into the side of the wooden building and had a dagger drawn by the time the thump finished echoing. Wesley's face, set with rage, seethed at her in the dark. Where in hell do you think you're going? He breathed, not loosening his grip on her shoulders even as she pressed her dagger to the side of his throat. Get out of my way, she growled, hardly recognizing her own voice. Arobin can't keep me locked up. I'm not talking about Arobin. Use your head and think, Selena. A flicker of her, a part of her that had somehow vanished since she'd shattered that clock, realized that this might be the first time he'd ever addressed her by her name. Get out of my way, she repeated, pushing the edge of the blade harder against his exposed throat. I know you want revenge, he panted. I do too, for what he did to Sam. I know you. She flicked the blade, angling it enough that he reared back to avoid her slicing a deep line across his throat. Don't you understand? He pleaded, his eyes gleaming in the dark. It's all just a... But the fire rose up in Selena, and she whirled, using a move the mute master had taught her that summer. And Wesley's eyes lost focus as she slammed the pommel of her dagger into the side of his head. He dropped like a stone. Before he'd even finished collapsing, Selena was sprinting for the fence. A moment later, she jumped it and vanished into the city streets. She was fire. She was darkness. She was dust and blood and shadow. She hurtled through the streets, each step faster than the last, as that black fire burned through thought and feeling, until all that remained was her rage and her prey. She took back alleys and leapt over walls. She'd slaughter them all. Faster and faster, sprinting for that beautiful house on its quiet street, for the two men who had taken her world apart piece by piece, bone by shattered bone. All she had to do was get to Jane and Farron. Everyone else was collateral. Arobin had said they'd both be in their beds. That meant she had to get past all those guards at the front gate, the front door, and on the first floor. Not to mention the guards that were sure to be outside the bedrooms. But there was an easier way to get past all them. A way in that didn't involve possibly alerting Farron and Jane if the guards at the front door raised the alarm. Harding had mentioned something about a window on the second floor that he could leap through. Harding was a good tumbler, but she was better. When she was a few streets away, she climbed the side of a house until she was on the roof and running again, fast enough to make the leap across the gap between houses. She'd walked past Jane's house enough time in the past few days to know that it was separated from its neighbors by alleys probably fifteen feet wide. She leapt across another gap between roofs. Now that she thought of it, she knew there was a second-floor window facing one of those alleys, and she didn't give a damn where that window opened to, just that it would get her inside before the guards on the first floor could notice. The emerald roof of Jane's house gleamed, and Selena skidded to a halt on the roof next door. A wide, flat stretch of the gabled roof stood between her and the long jump across the alley. If she aimed correctly and ran fast enough, she could make that leap and land through that second-floor window. The window was already thrown open, though the curtains had been drawn, blocking any view of what was within. Despite the fog of rage, years of training made her instinctively scan the neighboring rooftops. Was it arrogance or stupidity that kept Jane from having guards on the nearby roofs? Even the guards on the street didn't look up at her. Selena untied her cloak and let it slide to the ground behind her. Any additional drag might be fatal, and she had no intention of dying until Jane and Farron were corpses. The roof on which she stood was three stories high and faced the second-floor window across the alley. She factored in the distance and how fast she'd be falling, and made sure the swords crossed to her back were neatly tucked in. The window was wide, but she still needed to avoid the blades catching on the threshold. She backed up as far as she could to give herself running space. Somewhere on that second floor slept Jane and Farron. And somewhere in this house they had destroyed Sam. After she had killed them, perhaps she'd tear the house down stone by stone. 
Perhaps she'd tear this entire city down, too. She smiled. She liked the sound of that. Then she took a deep breath and broke into a run. The roof was no longer than fifty feet. Fifty feet between her and the jump that would either land her right through that open window a level below, or splatter her on the alley between. She sprinted for the ever-nearing edge. Forty feet. There was no room for error. No room for fear or sorrow or anything except that blinding rage and cold, vicious calculation. Thirty feet. She raced, straight as an arrow, each pump of her legs and arms bringing her closer. Twenty. Ten. The alley below loomed, the gap looking far bigger than she'd realized. Five. But there was nothing left of her to even consider stopping. Selena reached the edge of the roof and leapt. Chapter 10 The cold kiss of night air on her face. The glitter of the wet streets under lamplight. The sheen of moonlight on the black curtains inside the open window as she arced toward it, hands already reaching for her daggers. She tucked her head into her chest, bracing for impact, as she burst through the curtains, ripping them clean off their hangings, hit the floor, and rolled. Right into a meeting room full of people. In a heartbeat, she took in the details. A somewhat small room where Jane, Farron, and others sat around a square table, and a dozen guards now staring at her, already formed into a wall of flesh and weaponry between her and her prey. The curtains were thick enough to have blocked out any light within the room, to make it look like it was dark and empty inside. A trick. It didn't matter. She'd take them all down anyway. The two daggers in her boots were thrown before she was even on her feet, and the guard's dying shouts brought a wicked grin to her lips. Her swords whined, both in her hands, as the nearest guard charged for her. He immediately died, a sword punched through his ribs and into his heart. Every object... Every person, between her and Farron, was an obstacle or a weapon, a shield or a trap. She whirled to the next guard, and her grin turned feral as she caught a glimpse of Jane and Farron at the other end of the room, seated across the table. Farron was smiling at her, his dark eyes bright, but Jane was on his feet, gaping. Selena buried one of her swords into the chest of a guard so she could reach for her third dagger. Jane was still gaping when that dagger embedded itself to the hilt in his neck. Utter pandemonium. The door flung open, and more guards poured in as she retrieved her second sword from the chest cavity of the fallen guard. It couldn't have been more than ten seconds since she'd leapt through the open window. Had they been waiting? Two guards lunged for her, swords slicing the air. Her twin blades flashed, blood sprayed. The room wasn't large. Only twenty feet separated her from Farron, who remained seated, watching her with wild delight. Three more guards went down. Someone hurled a dagger at her, and she knocked it aside with a blade, sending it right into the leg of another guard. Unintentional, but lucky. Another two guards fell. There were only a few left between her and the table, and Farron at the other side. He didn't even look at Jane's corpse, slumped on the table beside him. Guards were still rushing in from the hall, but they were all wearing strange black masks, masks with clear glass eyepieces and some sort of cloth mesh over the mouths. And then the smoke started, and the door shut, and as she gutted another guard, she glanced at Farron in time to see him slide on a mask. She knew this smoke, knew this smell. It had been on Sam's corpse that musky, strange. Someone sealed the window, shutting out the air. Smoke everywhere, fogging everything. Her eyes stung, but she dropped a sword to reach for that last dagger, the one that would find its home in Farron's skull. The world jolted to the side. No. She didn't know if she said it or thought it, but the word echoed through the darkness that was devouring her. Another masked guard had reached her, 
and she straightened in time to drive a sword into his side. Blood soaked her hand, but she kept her grip on the blade. Kept her grip on the dagger in her other hand as she cocked it back, angling for Farron's head. But the smoke invaded every pore, every breath, every muscle. As she arched her arm, a shudder went through her body, making her vision twist and falter. She swayed to the side, losing her grip on the dagger. A guard swiped for her, but missed, slicing off an inch from her braid instead. Her hair broke free in a golden wave as she careened to the side, falling so, so slowly, Farron still smiling at her. A guard's fist slammed into her gut, knocking the air out of her. She reeled back, and another fist like granite met her face. Her back, her ribs, her jaw. So many blows, so fast the pain couldn't keep up. And she was falling so slowly, breathing in all that smoke. They had been waiting for her. The invitingly open window. The smoke and the masks were all a part of a plan, and she had fallen right into it. She was still falling as the blackness consumed her. None of you are to touch her, a cool, bored voice was saying. She's to be kept alive. There were hands on her, prying her weapons out of her grip, then setting her into a sitting position against the wall. Fresh air poured into the room, but she could hardly feel it on her tingling face. She couldn't feel anything, couldn't move anything. She was paralyzed. She managed to open her eyes, only to find Farron crouched in front of her, that feline smile still on his face. The smoke had cleared from the room, and his mask lay discarded behind him. Hello, Selena, he purred. Someone had betrayed her. Not Arobin, not when he hated Jane and Farron so much. If she'd been betrayed, it would have been one of the wretches in the guild, someone who would have benefited most from her death. It couldn't be Arobin. Farron's dark gray clothes were immaculate. I've been waiting a few years to meet you, you know, he said, sounding rather cheerful despite the blood and bodies. To be honest he went on, his eyes devouring every inch of her in a way that made her stomach start to twist. I'm disappointed. You walked right into our little trap. You didn't even stop to think twice about it, did you? Farron smiled. Never underestimate the power of love. Or is it revenge? She couldn't convince her fingers to shift. Even blinking was an effort. Don't worry. The numbness from the Gloriella is already fading, though you won't be able to move much at all. It should wear off in about six hours. At least that's how long it lasted on your companion after I caught him. It's a particularly effective tool for keeping people sedated without the constraints of shackles. Makes the process much more... enjoyable. Even if you can't scream as much. Gods above. Gloriella the same poison Ansel had used on the mute master, somehow warped into incense. He must have caught Sam, brought him back here, used the smoke on him, and he was going to torture her, too. She could withstand some torture, but considering what had been done to Sam, she wondered how quickly she'd break. If she'd had control over herself, she'd have ripped out Farron's throat with her teeth. Her only glimmer of hope came from the fact that Arobin and the others would arrive soon. And even if one of her kind had betrayed her, when Arobin found out, when he saw whatever Farron had started to do to her, he'd keep Farron alive, if only so when she recovered she could gut him herself. Gut him, and take a damn long time to do it. Farron stroked the hair out of her eyes, tucking it behind her ears. She'd shatter that hand, too the way Sam's hands had been methodically shattered. Behind Farron, guards began dragging the bodies away. No one touched Jane's corpse, still sprawled on the table. You know, Farron murmured, you're really quite beautiful. He ran a finger down her cheek, then along her jaw. 
Her rage became a living thing thrashing inside of her, fighting for just one chance to break free. I can see why Aerobin kept you as a pet for so many years. His finger went lower, sliding across her neck. How old are you, anyway? She knew he didn't expect an answer. His eyes met hers, dark and ravenous. She wouldn't beg. If she were to die like Sam, she'd do so with dignity, with that rage still burning. And maybe, maybe she'd get the chance to butcher him. I'm half tempted to keep you for myself, he said. He brushed his thumb over her mouth. Instead of handing you over, perhaps I'll take you downstairs. And if you survive. He shook his head. But that wasn't part of the bargain, was it? Words boiled up in her, but her tongue didn't move. She couldn't even open her mouth. You're dying to know what the bargain was, aren't you? Let's see if I remember correctly. We kill Sam Cortland, Farron recited. You go berserk and break in here, then you kill Jane. He gave a nod toward the huge body on the table. And I take Jane's place. His hands were roving over her neck now, sensual caresses that promised unbearable agony. With each passing second, some of the numbness did indeed wear off. But hardly any control of her body returned. Pity that I need you to take the blame for Jane's death. And if only handing you over to the king wouldn't make such a nice gift. The king. He wasn't going to torture her, or kill her, but give her to the king as a bribe to keep royal eyes from looking Farron's way. She could have faced torture, endured the violations she could practically see in Farron's eyes. But if she went to the king, she shoved the thought away refusing to follow its path. She had to get out. He must have seen the panic enter her eyes. Farron smiled, a hand closing around her throat. Two sharp nails pricked her skin. Don't be afraid, Selena, he whispered into her ear, digging his nails in deeper. If the king lets you survive, I'm in your eternal debt. You've handed me my crown, after all. There was one word on her lips, but she couldn't get it out, no matter how much she tried. Who? Who had betrayed her so foully? She could understand hating her. But Sam. Everyone had adored Sam, even Wesley. Wesley. He had tried to tell her. It's all just a... And his face hadn't been set with irritation, but with grief. Grief and rage, directed not at her, but at someone else. Had Aerobin sent Wesley to warn her? Harding, the assassin who had been talking about the window, had always had an eye on her position as Aerobin's heir. And he'd practically spoon-fed her the details about where to break in, how to break in. It had to be him. Maybe Wesley had figured it out just as she was breaking out of the keep. Because the alternative? No. She couldn't even think of the alternative. Farron pulled back, loosening his grip on her throat. I do wish I'd been allowed to play with you for a bit. But I swore not to harm you. He cocked his head to the side, taking in the injuries she'd already suffered. I think a few bruised ribs and a split lip are excusable. He pulled out a pocket watch. Alas, it's eleven. And you and I both have places to be. Eleven. An hour before Aerobin would even leave the keep. And if Harding had actually been the one to betray her, then he'd probably do his best to delay them even further. Once she was brought to the royal dungeons, what odds did Aerobin have of successfully breaking her out? When the Gloriella wore off, what odds did she have of breaking out? Farron's eyes were still on hers, glittering with delight. And then, without warning, his arm slashed through the air. She heard the sound of a hand against flesh before she felt the stinging throb in her cheek and mouth. The pain was faint. She was thankful the numbness was still clinging to her, especially as the coppery tang of blood filled her mouth. Farron gracefully rose from his crouch. That was for getting blood on the carpet. 
Despite the sideways angle of her head, she managed to glare up at him, even as her blood slid down her throat. Farron straightened his gray tunic, then leaned down to turn her head forward. His smile returned. You would have been delightful to break, he told her, and strode from the room, motioning to three tall, well-dressed men as he passed. Not petty guards. She'd seen those three men before. Somewhere. At some point that she couldn't quite recall. One of the men approached, smiling, despite the gore pooled around her. Selena glimpsed the rounded pommel of his sword before it connected with her head. Chapter 11 Selena awoke with a pulsing headache. She kept her eyes shut, letting her senses take in her surroundings, before she announced to the world that she was awake. Wherever she was, it was quiet and damp and cold and reeked of mildew and refuse. She knew three things before she even opened her eyes. The first was that at least six hours had passed, because she could wriggle her toes and fingers, and those movements were enough to tell her that all of her weapons had been removed. The second was that because at least six hours had passed, and Aerobin and the others clearly had not found her. She was either in the royal dungeons across the city, or in some cell beneath Jane's house, awaiting transport. The third was that Sam was still dead, and even her rage had been a pawn in some betrayal so twisted and brutal she couldn't begin to wrap her aching head around it. Sam was still dead. She opened her eyes, finding herself indeed in a dungeon, dumped onto a rotten pallet of hay and chained to the wall. Her feet had also been shackled to the floor, and both sets of chains had just enough slack that she could make it to the filthy bucket in the corner to relieve herself. That was the first indignity she allowed herself to suffer. Once she'd taken care of her bladder, she looked about the cell. No windows, and not enough space between the iron door and the threshold for anything more than light to squeeze through. She couldn't hear anything. Not through the walls, nor coming from outside. Her mouth was parched her tongue leaden in her mouth. But she wouldn't give for a mouthful of water to wash away the lingering taste of blood. Her stomach was painfully empty, too, and the throbbing in her head sent splinters of light through her skull. She had been betrayed. Betrayed by Harding or someone like him, someone who would benefit from her being permanently gone, with no hope of ever coming back. And Arobin still hadn't rescued her. He'd find her, though. He had to. She tested the chains on her wrists and ankles, examining where they were anchored into the stone floor and walls, looking over every link, studying the locks. They were solid. She felt all the stones around her, tapping for loose bits or possibly a whole block that she could use as a weapon. There was nothing. All the pins had been pulled out of her hair, robbing her of a chance to even try to pick the lock. The buttons on her black tunic were too small and delicate to be useful. Perhaps if a guard came in, she could get him close enough to use the chains against him, strangle him or knock him unconscious, or hold him hostage long enough for someone to let her out. Perhaps. The door groaned open, and a man filled the threshold, three others behind him. His tunic was dark and embroidered with golden thread, if he was surprised to see her awake, he didn't reveal it. Royal guards. This was the royal dungeon, then. The guard in the doorway placed the food he was carrying on the floor and slid the tray toward her. Water, bread, a hunk of cheese. Dinner, he said, not stepping one foot in the room. He and his companions knew the threat of getting too close. Selena glanced at the tray. Dinner. How long had she been down here? Had it been nearly a whole day, and Aerobin still hadn't come for her? He had to have found Wesley by the stables, and Wesley would have told him what she'd gone to do. He had to know she was here. The guard was watching her. This dungeon is impenetrable, he said, and those chains are made with Otterlanian steel. She stared at him. He was middle-aged, 
perhaps forty. He wore no weapons. Another precaution. Usually the royal guards joined young and stayed until they were too old to carry a sword. That meant this man had years of extensive training. It was too dark to see the three guards behind him, but she knew they wouldn't trust just anyone to watch her. And even if he'd said the words to intimidate her into behaving, he was probably telling the truth. No one got out of the royal dungeons, and no one got in. If it had been a whole day and Arobin hadn't yet found her, she wasn't getting out either. If her betrayer had been able to fool her, and Sam, and Arobin, then they'd find a way to keep the King of the Assassins from knowing she was in here too. Now that Sam was dead, there wasn't anything left outside of the dungeons worth fighting for anyway. Not when Otterlin's assassin was crumbling apart, and her world with her. The girl who'd taken on a pirate lord and his entire island. The girl who'd stolen Asterian horses and raced along the beach in the Red Desert. The girl who'd sat on her own rooftop, watching the sun rise over the Avery. The girl who'd felt alive with possibility. That girl was gone. There wasn't anything left. And Arobin wasn't coming. She'd failed. And worse, she'd failed Sam. She hadn't even killed the man who'd ended his life so viciously. The guard shifted on his feet, and she realized she'd been staring at him. The food is clean, was all the guard said before he backed out of the room and shut the door. She drank the water and ate as much of the bread and cheese as she could stomach. She couldn't tell if the food itself was bland or if her tongue had just lost all sense of taste. Every bite tasted like ash. She kicked the tray toward the door when she was finished. She didn't care that she could have used it as a weapon or as a lure to get one of the guards closer. Because she wasn't getting out, and Sam was dead. Selena leaned her head against the freezing, damp wall. She'd never be able to make sure he was safely buried in the earth. She'd failed him even in that. When the roaring silence came to claim her again, Selena walked into it with open arms. The guards liked to talk. About sporting events, about women, about the movement of Otterlin's armies. About her, most of all. Sometimes, flickers of their conversations broke through the wall of silence, holding her attention for a moment before she let the quiet sweep her back out to its endless sea. The captain's going to be furious he wasn't here for the trial. Serves him right for gallivanting with the prince along the Surian coast. Snickers. I heard the captain's racing back to Rifthold, though. What's the point? Her trial is tomorrow. He won't even make it in time to see her executed. You think she's really Selena Sardothian? She looks my daughter's age. Better not tell anyone. The king said he'd flay us all alive if we breathe one word. Hard to imagine that it's her. Did you see the list of victims? It went on and on. You think she's wrong in the head? She just looks at you without really looking at you, you know? I bet they needed someone to pay for Jane's death. They probably grabbed a simple girl to pretend it was her. Snorts. Won't matter to the king, will it? And if she won't talk, then it's her own damn fault if she's innocent. I don't think she's really Selena Sardothian. I heard it'll be a closed trial and execution, because the king doesn't want anyone seeing who she really is. Trust the king to deny everyone else the chance to watch. I wonder if they'll hang or behead her. Chapter 12 The world flashed. Dungeons, rotten hay, cold stones against her cheek. Guards talking. Bread and cheese and water. Then guards entered. Crossbows aimed at her, hands on their swords. Two days had passed somehow. A rag and a bucket of water were thrown at her. Clean herself up for the trial, they said. She obeyed. And she didn't struggle when they gave her new shackles on her wrists and ankles. Shackles she could walk in. They took her down a dark, cold hallway that echoed with distant groans. Then up the stairs. Sunlight shone through a barred window. Harsh. Blinding. As they went up more stairs 
and eventually into a room of stone and polished wood. The wooden chair was smooth beneath her. Her head still ached, and the places where Farron's men had struck her were still sore. The room was large, but sparsely appointed. She'd been shoved into a chair set in the center of the room, a safe distance from the massive table on the far end, the table at which twelve men sat facing her. She didn't care who they were, or what their role was. She could feel their eyes on her, though. Everyone in the room, the men at the table and the dozens of guards, was watching her. A hanging or a beheading, her throat closed up. There was no point in fighting. Not now. She deserved this. For more reasons than she could count. She should never have allowed Sam to convince her to dispatch Farron on his own. It was her fault. All of it. Set in motion the day she'd arrived in Skull's Bay and decided to make a stand for something. A small door at the back of the room opened, and the men at the table got to their feet. Heavy boots stomping across the floor the guards straightening and saluting. The King of Otterlin entered the room. She wouldn't look at him. Let him do what he wanted to her. If she looked into his eyes, what semblance of calm she had would be shredded. So it was better to feel nothing than to cower before him. The butcher who had destroyed so much of Aurelia. Better to go to her grave numb and dazed than begging. A chair at the center of the table was pulled back. The men around the king didn't sit until he did. Then silence. The wooden floor of the room was so polished that she could see the reflection of the iron chandelier hanging far above her. A low chuckle, like bone against rock. Even without looking at him, she could sense his sheer mass, the darkness swirling around him. I didn't believe the rumors until now, the king said. But it seems the guards were not lying about your age. A faint urge to cover her ears, to shut out that wretched voice, flickered in the back of her mind. How old are you? She didn't reply. Sam was gone. Nothing she could do, even if she fought, even if she raged, could change that. Did Rourke Farron get his claws on you, or are you just being willful? Farron's face, leering at her, smiling so viciously as she was helpless before him. Very well, then, the king said, papers being shuffled, the only sound in the deathly silent room. Do you deny that you are Selena Sardothian? If you do not speak, then I will take your silence for acquiescence, girl. She kept her mouth shut. Then read the charges, Councillor Rensel. A male throat was cleared. You, Selena Sardothian, are charged with the deaths of the following people. And then he began a long recitation of all those lives she'd taken. The brutal story of a girl who was now gone. Arobin had always seen to it that the world knew of her handiwork. He always got word out through secret channels when another victim had fallen to Selena Sardothian. And now... The very thing that had earned her the right to call herself Otterlin's assassin would be what sealed her doom. When it was over, the man said, Do you deny any of the charges? Her breathing was so slow. Girl, the councilman said a bit shrilly, we will take your lack of response to mean you do not deny them. Do you understand that? She didn't bother to nod. It was all over anyway. Then I will decide your sentence, the king growled. Then there was murmuring, more rustling papers, and a cough. The light on the floor flickered. The guards in the room remained focused on her, weapons at the ready. Footsteps suddenly thudded toward her from the table, and she heard the sound of weapons being angled. She recognized the footsteps before the king even reached her chair. Look at me. She kept her gaze on his boots. Look at me! It made no difference now, did it? He'd already destroyed so much of Aurelia. Destroyed parts of her without even knowing it. Look at me! 
Selena raised her head and looked at the king of Otterlin. The blood drained from her face. Those black eyes were poised to devour the world. The features were harsh and weathered. He wore a sword at his side, the sword whose name everyone knew, and a fine tunic and fur cloak. No crown rested on his head. She had to get away. Had to get out of this room. Get away from him. Get away. Do you have any last requests before I announce your sentence? He asked, those eyes still searing through every defense she'd ever learned. She could still smell the smoke that had suffocated every inch of Terrison nine years ago. Still smell the sizzling flesh and hear the futile screams as the king and his armies wiped out every last trace of resistance, every last trace of magic. No matter what Aerobin had trained her to do, the memories of those last weeks as Terrison fell were imprinted upon her blood, so she just stared at him. When she didn't reply, he turned on his heel and walked back to the table. She had to get away. Forever. Brash, foolish fire flared up and turned her, only for a moment, into that girl again. I do, she said, her voice hoarse from disuse. The king paused and looked over his shoulder at her. She smiled. A wicked, wild thing. Make it quick. It was a challenge, not a plea. The king's council and the guards shifted, some of them murmuring. The king's eyes narrowed slightly, and when he smiled at her, it was the most horrific thing she'd ever seen. Oh, he said, turning to face her fully. That foolish fire went out. If it is an easy death you desire, Selena Sardothian, I will certainly not give it to you. Not until you have adequately suffered. The world balanced on the edge of a knife, slipping, slipping, slipping. You, Selena Sardothian, are sentenced to nine lives worth of labor in the salt mines of Endovier. Her blood turned to ice. The councilmen all glanced at one another. Obviously, this option hadn't been discussed beforehand. You will be sent with orders to keep you alive for as long as possible. So you will have the chance to enjoy Endovier's special kind of agony. Endovier. Then the king turned away. Endovier. There was a flurry of motion and the king barked an order to have her on the first wagon out of the city. Then there were hands on her arms, and crossbows pointed at her, as she was half dragged out of the room. And Dovier. She was thrown in her dungeon cell for minutes, or hours, or a day. Then more guards came to fetch her, leading her up the stairs, into the still blinding sun. And Dovier. New shackles, hammered shut the dark interior of a prison wagon, the turn of multiple locks, the jostle of horses starting into a walk, and many other horses surrounding the wagon. Through the small window high in the door wall, she could see the capital, the streets she knew so well, the people milling about and glancing at the prison wagon and the mounted guards, but not thinking about who might be inside, the golden dome of the royal theater in the distance the briny scent of a breeze off the Avery, the emerald tiled roofs and white stones of every building, all passing by, all so quickly. They passed the assassin's keep where she had trained and bled and lost so much, the place where Sam's body lay, waiting for her to bury him. The game had been played, and she had lost. Now they came to the looming alabaster walls of the city, their gates thrown wide to accommodate their large party. As Selena Sardothian was led out of the capital, she sank into a corner of the wagon and did not get up. Standing atop one of the many emerald roofs of Rifthold, Rourke Farron and Arobin Hamel watched as the prison wagon was escorted out of the city. A chill breeze swept off the Avery ruffling their hair. And Dovier, then, Farron mused, 
his dark eyes still upon the wagon. A surprising twist of events. I thought you had planned a grand rescue from the butchering block. The King of Assassins said nothing. So you're not going after the wagon? Obviously not, Arobin said, glancing at the new crime lord of Rifthold. It had been on this very rooftop that Farron and the King of the Assassins had first run into each other. Farron had been going to spy on one of Jane's mistresses, and Arobin, well, Farron had never learned why Arobin had been meandering across the roofs of Rifthold in the middle of the night. You and your men could free her in a matter of moments, Rourke went on. Attacking a prison wagon is far safer than what you had originally planned. Though I'll admit, sending her to Endovier is far more interesting to me. If I wanted your opinion, Farron, I would have asked for it. Farron gave him a slow smile. You might want to consider how you speak to me now. And you might want to consider who gave you your crown. Farron chuckled, and silence fell for a long moment. If you wanted her to suffer, you should have left her in my care. I could have had her begging for you to save her in a matter of minutes. It would have been exquisite. Arobin just shook his head. Whatever gutter you grew up in, Farron, it must have been an unparalleled sort of hell. Farron studied his new ally, his gaze glittering. You have no idea. After another moment of quiet, he asked, Why did you do it? Arobin's attention drifted back to the wagon, already a small dot in the rolling foothills above Rifthold. Because I don't like sharing my belongings. After. She had been in the wagon for two days now, watching the light shift and dance on the walls. She only moved from the corner long enough to relieve herself or to pick at the food they threw in for her. She had believed she could love Sam and not pay the price. Everything has a price. She'd once been told by a spider silk merchant in the Red Desert. How right he was. Sun shone through the wagon again, filling it with weak light. The trek to the salt mines of Endovier took two weeks, and each mile led them farther and farther north and into colder weather. When she dozed, falling in and out of dreams and reality, and sometimes not knowing the difference, she was often awoken by the shivers that racked her body. The guards offered her no protection against the chill. Two weeks in this dark, reeking wagon with only the shadows and light on the wall for company, and the silence hovering around her. Two weeks, and then Endovier. She lifted her head from the wall. The growing fear set the silence flickering. No one survived Endovier. Most prisoners didn't survive a month. It was a death camp. A tremor went down her numb fingers. She drew her legs in tighter to her chest, resting her head against them. The shadows and the light continued to play on the wall. Excited whispers. The crunching of rushing feet on dried grass. Moonlight shining through the window. She didn't know how she got upright, or how she made it to the tiny barred window, her legs stiff and aching and wobbly from disuse. The guards were gathered near the edge of the clearing they'd camped in for the night, staring out into the tangle of trees. They'd entered Oakwald Forest sometime on the first day, and now it would be nothing but trees, trees, trees for the two weeks that they would travel north. The moon illuminated the mist swirling along the leaf-strewn ground and made the trees cast long shadows like lurking wraiths. And there, standing in a corpse of thorns, was a white stag. Selena's breath hitched. She clenched the bars of the small window as the creature looked at them. His towering antlers seemed to glow in the moonlight, crowning him in wreaths of ivory. God's above, one of the guards whispered. The stag's enormous head turned slightly, toward the wagon, toward the small window. The Lord of the North. 
so the people of Terrason will always know how to find their way home. She'd once told Ansel, as they lay under a blanket of stars and traced the constellation of the stag, so they can look up at the sky, no matter where they are, and no Terrason is forever with them. Tendrils of hot air puffed from the stag's snout, curling in the chill night. Selena bowed her head, though she kept her gaze upon him. So the people of Terrason will always know how to find their way home. A crack in the silence, spreading wider and wider as the stag's fathomless eyes stayed steady on her. A glimmer of a world long since destroyed, a kingdom in ruins. The stag shouldn't be here, not so deep into Otterlin or so far from home. How had he survived the hunters who had been set loose nine years ago? And yet he was here, glowing like a beacon in the moonlight. He was here. And so was she. She felt the warmth of the tears before she realized she was crying. Then the unmistakable groan of bowstrings being pulled back. The stag, her lord of the north, her beacon, didn't move. Run! The hoarse scream erupted out of her. It shattered the silence. The stag remained staring at her. She banged on the side of the wagon. Run, damn you! The stag turned and sprinted, a bolt of white light weaving through the trees. The twang of bowstrings, the hiss of arrows, all missing their mark. The guards cursed, and the wagon shook as one of them struck it in frustration. Selena backed away from the window, backed up, 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 until she ran into the wall and collapsed to her knees. The silence had gone. In its absence, she could feel the barking pain echo through her legs, and the ache of the injuries Farron's men had given her, and the dull stinging of wrists and ankles rubbed raw by chains. And she could feel the endless hole where Sam had once been. She was going to Endovier. She was to be a slave in the salt mines of Endovier. Fear, ravenous and cold, dragged her under. Beginning Selena Sardothian knew she was nearing the salt mines when, two weeks later, the trees of Oakwald gave way to gray, rough terrain, and jagged mountains pierced the sky. She'd been lying on the floor since dawn and had already vomited once. And now she couldn't bring herself to stand up. Sounds in the distance. Shouting and the faint crack of a whip. And Dovier. She wasn't ready. The light turned brighter as they left the trees behind. She was glad Sam wasn't here to see her like this. She let out a sob so violent she had to press her fist to her mouth to keep from being heard. She'd never be ready for this, for Endovier and the world without Sam. A breeze filled the wagon, lifting away the smells of the past two weeks. Her trembling paused for a heartbeat. She knew that breeze. She knew the chill bite beneath it. Knew it carried the hint of pine and snow. Knew the mountains from which it hailed. A northern breeze. A breeze of Terrason. She must stand up. Pine and snow and lazy golden summers. A city of light and music in the shadow of the Staghorn Mountains. She must stand or be broken before she even entered Endovier. The wagon slowed, wheels bouncing over the rough path. A whip snapped. My name is Selena Sardothian, she whispered onto the floor. But her lips shook hard enough to cut off the words. Somewhere. Someone started screaming. From the shift in the light, she knew they were nearing what had to be a giant wall. My name is Selena Sardothian, she tried again. She gasped down uneven breaths. The breeze grew into a wind, and she closed her eyes, letting it sweep away the ashes of that dead world, of that dead girl. And then there was nothing left, except something new, something still glowing red from the forging. Selena opened her eyes. 
she would go into Endovir. Go into hell. And she would not crumble. She braced her palms on the floor and slid her feet beneath her. She had not stopped breathing yet, and she had endured Sam's death and evaded the king's execution. She would survive this. Selena stood, turning to the window and looking squarely at the mammoth stone wall rising up ahead of them. She would tuck Sam into her heart, a bright light for her to take out whenever things were darkest. And then she would remember how it had felt to be loved, when the world had held nothing but possibility. No matter what they did to her, they could never take that away. She would not break. And someday, someday, even if it took her until her last breath, she'd find out who had done this to her, to Sam. Selena wiped away her tears as the wagon entered the shade of the tunnel through the wall. Whips and screams and the clank of chains. She tensed, already taking in every detail she could. But she squared her shoulders, straightened her spine. My name is Selena Sardafian, she whispered. And I will not be afraid. The wagon cleared the wall and stopped. Selena raised her head. The wagon door was unlocked and thrown open, flooding the space with gray light. Guards reached for her, mere shadows against the brightness. She let them grab her, let them pull her from the wagon. I will not be afraid. Selena Sardothian lifted her chin and walked into the salt mines of Endovir. This has been an Audible Studios production of The Assassin's Blade, The Throne of Glass Novellas. Written by Sarah J. Mass. Narrated by Elizabeth Evans. Producer, Mike Charzik. Copyright 2014 by Sarah J. Mass. Production copyright 2014 by Audible Inc. Audible Studios is a division of Audible Inc. If you enjoyed this audiobook, be sure to get more books in the Throne of Glass series today. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.